Postal. Art Castle and McCormick next Sunday. John Collum. In this evening's ABC Theatre presentation of The Day After, I play a father in a typical American family who experienced the catastrophic events of a full-scale nuclear war. Before the movie begins, we would like to caution parents about the graphic depiction of nuclear explosions and their devastating effects. The emotional impact of these scenes may be unusually disturbing and we are therefore recommending that very young children not be permitted to watch. In homes where young people are watching, We'd like to suggest that the family watch together so that parents can be on hand to answer questions and discuss issues raised by the movie. Immediately following the day after, ABC will present a special edition of Viewpoint that will explore some of the political, military, and psychological aspects of the nuclear age. In a moment, the day after. Last year, we asked our competition to pick the best personal computer based on price and memory. They all chose the Commodore 64. With all the changes in the computer industry, we thought we'd better check again. The new IBM personal computer chose the Commodore 64. The new Apple IIe chose the Commodore 64. The more things change, the more things stay the same. Commodore, in more homes than any other home computer. Search presents The Encounter. You never know when you're going to wind up face to face with someone. With Search, you're always ready. Excuse me, I was depressed. Excuse me, so I'm... I... I missed him. Only Search has a great taste plus a glistening drop of Retson and a fresh, clean flavor to get your breath fresh enough to go face to face. Now what? Dinner. I get the picture. Search regular and sugar-free for breath that's face to face fresh. I'm with the remarkable new Minolta Talker. When the light's too dim, it talks to you. Too dark, use flash. When you're out of flash range, it tells you. Check distance. And when the camera's empty? Load film. It's the auto exposure, auto focus, 35 millimeter camera that loads, advances, and rewinds the film all automatically. The new Minolta Talker talks you into good pictures. Great pictures. Only from the mind of Minolta. How do I feel? Miserable. My nose is stuffed up, my sinus is hurt, I can't breathe. Get Duration Nasal Spray and get your mind off your nose for up to 12 hours. Duration helps you breathe freely with the longest lasting nasal decongestant you can get. And Duration goes to work fast. How's my stuffy nose? Great! Thanks to Duration. Duration Nasal Spray. Get your mind off your nose for up to 12 hours.
all the way south to check for which the United States fears would seriously jeopardize the current round of the siege of arms in Dutch The Soviet ambassador declared the maneuver to be the usual Warsaw Pact training exercise. Ambassador Shepard told him that that explanation was unacceptable and called the action provocative. Ambassador Krajan? Provocative? You call us provocative? When your Americans have 260,000 soldiers and 7,000 nuclear weapons poised on the other side of our border. A lot of kids are born with it, but we can do something about it these days. Now here's the problem. The septa don't meet properly. The aorta is rising from the right ventricle and the pulmonary from the left. I'm going to go in here and make a nice little hole between the two sides of the heart to allow the blood to carry enough oxygen to the rest of the body. Can you schedule it for Saturday? No way. I'm playing 36 hours straight up at Lawrence starting tomorrow. Hello, Joe. What did you have for lunch? Oh, I had turkey with yams. Nurse says she's giving me some ice cream, but she didn't come back. What flavor you like best? Vanilla. Coffee thing got vanilla. You heard the man. Let's find him his ice cream. Dad, your schedule's busier than the president's. Maybe I should run for office. What, do I have to make an appointment for open heart surgery or something to get an hour with you? Hey, what's eating you, fruitcake? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just jumpy. Don't say I sound like Mom, please. Ah, you saw 60 Minutes last night. Uh huh? No, come on. I'm taking you someplace you work right next to, and I bet never been inside in 15 years. Well, come on. Sometimes it's hard to know how to experience a Chinese landscape because the artist doesn't tell you where you're watching from, like in a Turner or a Corot or something. You know why? Because he wants you to be in the landscape, a part of it, not out here looking at it. You mean a God's eye point of view? No. Well, yes, if by God you mean everywhere in, inside sort of thing, yeah. Got that funny in-between look. In between what? In between knowing whether you should tell me something or not. Okay, Daddy. I'm moving to Boston. Oh. How come? See, that's why I didn't want to tell you right away. <laughs> I have to deal with your hurt feelings and mom's. Not well, just all I asked was why. Pop, it's time for me to leave home. But you haven't been living at home for two years. An apartment 26 blocks away isn't exactly Independence, Missouri, you know. Of course, uh, choosing Boston wouldn't have anything to do with, uh, what's his name? Gary. Gary, uh, starting Tufts Medical this fall. No. Well, <laughs> maybe a little. But it's not like we're going to be living together or anything. At least not right away. Growing up, it's like growing apart. Maybe it's a natural phenomenon, like the expanding universe. Have you told your mother? Uh, tomorrow. I thought I'd start with you and work my way up. Oh, I'm easy. <laughs> Easier. <laughs> it's not so easy, you know. What? Saying goodbye. Hey, any of you guys hear anything about an alert? Not this weekend, buddy. I'm going fishing. <laughs> Who goes fishing? He generally falls in love. You fall in love. You fall in love. Every weekend you fall in love. What's wrong with you, two fish? You got no self-control? <laughs> Come to think of it, I could use a nice quiet weekend. Weekend hell, buddy, I got 30 days. Hey, me and Maureen's gonna take Skip on down to New Orleans. Well, I wouldn't go making any big travel plans for a while. Is that an order? Just a feeling. There's no sight checks due, sir, and no problems with the personnel, no weather warnings. Sounds good. Scam Stanton, ready to authenticate? Mm -hmm. 
Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, Golf, Hotel, Victor. Yep. Clear. How's it going? Good. How's the weather topside? Oh, just Beautiful. fine. Excellent. Morning. How you doing? What do you have for us today? Uh, everything looks to be normal. Barrel 35, I'm requesting permission to land. Barrel 35, this is Officer 1 Control. You're clear to land with our 230th channel. Roger, Officer 1. Where are you bringing in? Dropping off the maintenance team. I'm gonna kick my butt if we're late for this thing. Oh, God. Would you hurry? My hair is gonna be a mess. Okay. Right, get off. Okay. Let's go. Hang on. Okay. I know Bruce, he is gonna make a grand entrance. We should have told her to come with us. Well, they probably just wanted a little privacy. Privacy? You know, Dad, privacy. Oh, <laughs> oh Jolene, that's disgusting. What did I tell you? Thought they weren't coming, huh, Reverend Rogers? Well, I figured they'd show some Sorry, Miss Dahlberg. Hi, Reverend Walker. Hi. Hey, buddy. Put this in your pocket. Hey, you bet. Well, shall we all get started? Uh, There's less. Oh, okay. Sorry we're late. What's the first stop? We're supposed to go to silo 37. Yeah? What's the problem? No problem. Just uh, general maintenance, that's all. Shoot. Last time we did general maintenance, it took us three days. What they say is wrong with this thing anyway. Won't fly. <laughs> hey, Willie, we got a silo here, man. Mommy, can I make cookies? You can't make cookies. You're only four. You could show me. Sure, kids, go ahead, but clean up. Tomatoes in the 
insistence on positioning medium-range Pershing twos and cruise missiles in Europe uh, has uh, caused Great Britain to reevaluate its own nuclear commitment, scrub it all together if the Labour Party had its way. You see, the real fear is that when the chips are down and the red light's blinking, that the United States won't really want to sacrifice Chicago for Hamburg, as the saying goes. Respondent in Europe confirmed that according to NATO intelligence reports, this morning, there are now three Soviet tank divisions poised along the Fulda Gap. The United States issued a strong protest regarding the Soviet presence in an emergency session of the UN Security Council this morning. A protest responded to indirectly this afternoon by Soviet foreign ministers meeting in Brussels for trade talks with the common market. Speaking with ABC News, the Soviet foreign minister claims the United States had the cart before the horse you can answer one question, can't you? That won't hurt you none. All right, one question, but remember... Where's Alan? Always <clears throat> you know over at Jackson's having supper. They had a varsity scrimmage at seven. Well, he didn't spend much time around here, does he? Who does? Looks like I'm here. Yeah. That's kind of nice. Thank you. I thought you taught hematology at Lawrence tonight. Sam's taking my classes for me. I'm uh, going out tomorrow afternoon. We'll go to the movies tonight. Hmm? We'll go to the Fern Hill Drive-In. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, what if he just stayed in? Yeah, suits me fine. Light a few candles, put on some raunchy music. What has gotten into you? What? You don't like my ideas? I love your ideas. Oh, you've been talking to Marilyn, haven't you? Yeah, she told me about the scholarship in uh, Boston. She said you were just marvelous about it. I think I handled myself pretty well. <laughs> it's good to see you're so excited about the move. Is that what's important? How excited she is? She'd follow Gary and that old rattle trap to Nome or New Mexico. Wait, she only applied to Boston because hey, he wait was... Wait a minute, let me turn this no, up. Please, minute, listen. You? I have been listening to that thing all day. The blockade of West Berlin continues. The action follows reports earlier this evening of widespread rebellion among several divisions of the East German Army. To repeat, East Germany tonight sealed off the borders to West Berlin, closing the four principal West German access corridors at Lauenburg, Helmstedt, Erlichausen, and Rudolf Stein. I don't believe it's happening. You want to go in the living room and watch? No. I just want to go upstairs, get into bed. With you. This is a Commodore home computer system. With it, you can learn music. <laughs> Take care of your household accounts, file your lists, type your letters, get into telecommunications, and entertain your family. But it all starts with the Commodore 64 or VIC-20. And now is the right time to start because the price of all Commodore software is now up to 50% less. Commodore computers, in more homes than any other home computer. On the coast of Colombia, South America, for centuries the art of straw weaving has been passed from mother to daughter. It is a tradition and part of the heritage. The same heritage Juan Valdez passes to his son. He teaches him to hand wash the Colombian coffee beans and dry them carefully in the sun. It is an art that has been passed on for generations. It is no wonder a country so rich in tradition grows the richest coffee in the world. We have been fascinated from the beginning. As a machine, the human body remains a supreme invention. To unlock its potential, we offer Soloflex. Simple and efficient, like the body itself. Which may explain why Soloflex looks less like a machine and more like a work of art. I'm Orville Redenbacher with my famous gourmet popping corn and my new gourmet microwave popping corn and handy pop and serve bags. <laughs> <laughs>
My special kernels pop lighter and fluffier than other corns. So do mine. Just pop it in your microwave, then pop it in your mouth. Mine tastes light and fluffy, too. So does mine. Pop my gourmet popping corn, or my new gourmet microwave popping corn. For the lightest, fluffiest popcorn, there's only one. Orville Redenbacher. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. Immediately following the day after, ABC News will broadcast a special edition of Viewpoint. We'll focus on the critical question, how to prevent nuclear war. We'll talk live with Secretary of State George Shultz and with a distinguished panel of experts, Henry Kissinger, Elie Wiesel, William F. Buckley, Jr., General Brent Scowcroft, and Carl Sagan. We'll also take questions from our audience on Viewpoint immediately following the day after. Tell me nothing like this was ever going to happen. Maureen is just an alert. That's all. I mean, we're going to run around and check things twice instead of once. That's it. Well, what am I going to tell my mother? She's got the house all set, a room for Skip. Well, why don't you go on down? No, no, I'm serious, honey. Why don't you just take Skip, go on down to your mother's, and then I'll just join you when this whole thing is over, okay? That's just great. I know I'm not making this any easier on you. I love you. Know that. Look, I love you too, Maureen. Look, look, just, look, just five and a half months. That's it. Five and a half months and I'll be out the service. I'll be working 40 hours a week, making 17 50 per hour. You, you taking everything you got? Damn it, Maureen, it's an alert! It is four sets of everything. It's just strictly by the book. I'm scared as what? Well. Look, sit down. Maureen, there's nothing to worry about. I'm going to be right next door. I'm going to be on the base the whole time, and I'm going to call you every night. at Arthur's tonight. They're all in town at the game. <laughs> it's not like we haven't ever made love before, Brucey. Oh, not without you getting sick on the pill or rolling out the haystack. <laughs> They're right <laughs> over there. Can't you wait two more days? No! You're crazy, you know that? Where is it? Upstairs. In my dressing table drawer. A lot of good it's doing up there. Go get it. Go on. Come on. Go get it. Come here! I'm just trying to kill 
Now the runners take the lead. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. East Germany tonight tightened its stranglehold on West Berlin by halting all air traffic in and out of Tegel and Tempelhof airports, severing the city's lifeline to the west. This action has been condemned by NATO foreign ministers as a blatant, unconscionable violation of international law. Jolene? Jolene! Jolene, you open this door right now. I'll never talk to you again. Jolene! Tomorrow, Berlin time, that 6 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, would be regarded as an act of war. After an emergency meeting with his cabinet and congressional leaders of both parties, the president tonight declared all United States military personnel on worldwide stage two alert. Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Karajan was summoned to the White House three quarters of an hour ago. Jolene! Now, would you girls be kind enough to tell me what the dickens is going on up here? She was in my... Well... All right. You don't have to tell me. But I expect the two of you to settle it amongst yourselves. Otherwise, I'll see that your father settles it for you. Now, Jolene, I could sure use some help with the casseroles when you're through. Give that to me, brat. Press Secretary David Towns reports that both sides are engaged in frank and earnest talks aimed at finding ways to diffuse the heightening crisis in Berlin. My God, it's 1962 all over again. Cuban Missile Crisis. Do you remember Kennedy on television? Telling Bruce to turn his boats around. Full retaliatory response. He didn't bat an eye. We were in New York, in bed. Just like this, remember? Under <laughs> 118th Street. Meatball sandwiches from Sharky. Your last year's residency. I swear that we made Maryland that night. We got up, went to the window, looked for the bombs. Didn't happen. It's not gonna happen now. Nah, people are crazy, but not that crazy. Well, you wanna know from crazy? Mm -hmm. The Donnellys left today for Guadalajara. Guadalajara? I, I swear it. I spoke to her as they were pulling out. He said they were dovetailing their vacation at the rising international temperature. Oh, cut it out. I'm not kidding. <laughs> well, they took their Vietnamese maid with them. And that rotten little barking <laughs> dog <laughs> on the porch in face. Oh, what about their little uh, combination tractor lawnmower golf cart with <laughs> silver hubcaps? <laughs> Probably. <sighs> what if it does happen? What do we do? think these cars are the same, you're in for a surprise. Sure, you can rent any of them at the airport, but the one from Dollar is different. It is? I don't see any difference. Do you see any difference? I don't see any difference. Do you see any difference? I don't see any difference. Does this look different to you? I can't tell the difference. Can you? I 
can't tell the difference. So what makes dollar different? The price. Dollar Rent-A-Car. You'll recognize the difference. Now you can rent a Ford Thunderbird for just $33 a day. Men never cease to amaze me. Some guys don't think twice about the cologne they use. But a cologne says a lot about a man. And I think the cologne that says it best is English leather. English leather has a clean, masculine scent. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, a man should wear English leather. Or nothing at all. Look, I don't fall for a guy just because he wears a nice cologne. But I know what I like. And I like a man to wear English leather. Or wear nothing at all. She is seductive. She is passionate. She is Christine. A 1958 Plymouth Fury with a taste for blood. Nothing you can do can stop her. Because how do you kill something that can't possibly be alive? Christine. Body by Plymouth. Soul by Satan. Rated R. Watch out for her soon at a theater near you. To lose weight, these dieters chose Slim Fast over Cambridge. I chose Slim Fast to lose weight. It's much more delicious than Cambridge, just like a chocolate shake. I picked the Slim Fast diet plan, and I lost weight. It has more protein than Cambridge, plus fiber and bran. I chose Slim Fast, and I lost weight. It costs less than Cambridge, and the taste? Terrific. Get Slim Fast, the delicious way to lose weight. Tonight's ABC Theater presentation, The Day After, will continue in a moment. I'm Ted Koppel. We'll examine the issues of nuclear war and peace on a special edition of ABC News Viewpoint. We'll hear from Secretary of State George Shultz and a distinguished panel and our live audience here in Washington on Viewpoint, immediately following the day after. Nothing for me, please. Nothing? That's right, a tall, cool glass of absolutely nothing. You got any? You're looking for nothing. Right. No added salts, no added chemicals, no calories. Nothing. No coloring, no preservatives, no fizz or foam. Gee, uh, I don't think I got any. Great beer. Nothing but the pure taste of water. Hey, thanks. Nothing to it. Great beer. Because nothing is better. Did you find a doctor yet? HMO PA in New Jersey is an employee health plan with over 500 family physicians in private practice who have met HMO's high qualifications. We'll have to pay that deductible. Is our checking account open? With HMO, there is never a deductible, and you never fill out a claim form. And I have that meeting in Chicago this week. If emergencies develop, you're covered anywhere in the world. It's a good thing I switched to HMO. We'll take care of you. <laughs> Ask your employer. In the winter, we get the Flyers on the ice and the Sixers on the court. But our number one favorite team is the Action News Sports team. Don Tollefson, Gary Papa, and Scott Palmer. Because no matter what the season or the sport, our sports team gives us all the sports we want. So watch Don Tollefson, Gary Papa, and Scott Palmer and see why the best team in the Delaware Valley plays for Action News, right? Right! Jack Coleman of Dynasty tomorrow at 4.
Romano. Where the hell have you been? Don't you just walk right by me when you hear me asking you a question. What are you doing sneaking in here? I'm not sneaking. I never sneak. Then why didn't you come in the back door? I didn't even know the door was unlocked, Daddy. I've been out with Bruce riding around. Riding around? All night? Frankly, Daddy, that's none of your business. As long as you live, oh. I'm... Daddy, please don't say that. Because I'm getting married tomorrow. Jolene! You get back in there and stop eavesdropping. I'm not eavesdropping. I'm just waiting for you to finish up so I can get back to the bathroom. Well, use the one outside the kitchen, honey. The water's freezing out there. Well, hurry it up for Pete's sake. Can't you see that we're talking? The whole world's just holding its breath to hear what you're talking about. What is all the commotion out there? Nothing, Evie. Honey, let's just forget what I said. You're no sneak. No one's doing this year. I mean, he's teaching those kids deep. Yeah, they sure look good. Yep. You got a boy out there? Yeah, yeah, number 80, Alan Oaks. Oh, yeah, I've been watching him. Got good hands, good hands. Good moves the outside. He's not afraid to take a hit. You have a son playing? Yeah, Doug Holland, number 68. Yeah, he's only a sophomore. Yeah, he's born guard, though, you know. Stocky. All heart. I try not to miss a practice when I'm not on the road. I don't like to embarrass him by hanging around the bench. <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm, I'm Doug Sr. Oh, Russ Oaks. Nice to meet you. Same here. Well, see you, Doug. Okay, bye. At NATO Harbor Unit, the broken through the Helmstead checkpoint into East Germany. And after heavy fighting or advancing under air support two miles along the E8 Bundesstrasse corridor past Marienborn toward Berlin. French news agency has received conflicting reports of East German resistance and heavy casualties. But ground observers have confirmed that two Soviet-built MiG-25s invaded West German airspace, firing several air-to-ground missiles at a NATO munitions storage facility and also hitting a school and hospital outside of Würzburg. General's aboard. Morning, sir. Welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Morning, everybody. Stand easy, please. How's everybody today? Good. Thank you very much. Higher headquarters missions being flown today. We have one flying from Dickham to Kadena, 8F4s, 4KC-135s. They were executed by the SAC Underground at 415, 0, 0415 this morning. The president is located in Camp David. The commander-in-chief of Europe is out of position until the 21st, and the vice sink sack is at Andrews for the day. He'll be back later this evening in approximately 1900 soon. Okay. This is the uh, current world intelligence situation, and uh, you might pay particular note to the uh, nuclear submarines off the east and west coast. While we save a single blue baby, they are forming hospitals in Würzburg. I'm afraid to listen to the radio anymore. Have you heard the latest? 
There is a rumor there in evacuates in Moscow. Yeah. There are even people leaving Kansas City because of the missile fields. Now I ask you, where does one go from Kansas City? To uh, the Yukon? To Tahiti? <laughs> we are not talking about Hiroshima anymore. Hiroshima was, was peanuts. What's going on? Do you understand what's going on in this world? Yeah. Stupidity has a habit of getting its way. Ah, oh, if that were true, we wouldn't be mending people's hearts. We'd be back in caves eating them. If that were true... Why bother doing anything? Dr. Oaks, Dr. Oaks, Dr. Oaks. Yes? Oh, Dr. Oaks, uh, your wife would like to come. Oh, thank you. Regarding the situation in Moscow. Of Moscow being evacuated. We repeat, according to foreign administration sources, the city of Moscow is being evacuated. It is not generally known in Washington at the present time whether the evacuation order indicates the entire population of Moscow or whether other major Soviet cities have been similarly affected by an evacuation order. Good luck, son. Make us proud. Forward. My mom. This year, two million families will send their kids off to college. But many of these kids won't be able to compete because they lack computer skills. A home computer can help. The Commodore 64 gives you more computer for less money than anyone else. Instead of saving for your kid's education, maybe you should spend a little for it. This is the album. This is the beat. Dance and madness goes straight to your feet. I'm dancing. It's hot. And there is always something there to remind me. It's smooth. Won't give me Dancing madness is in the groove. We're gonna rock down to Electric Avenue. Outrageous. Boy. Dance and madness. The album's new at a store near you. Louise, I bought carpet deodorizers. You goofed, Harry. Arm & Hammer Extra Strength Carpet & Room Deodorizer works better, costs less. Ooh, fresh, clean scent. Has more odor-destroying ingredients than those two combined. And look, while they sit on top, Arm & Hammer Extra Strength penetrates to destroy deep-down odors. Room smells fresh. Right. And it costs less. Right. Arm & Hammer Extra Strength Carpet & Room Deodorizer works better, costs less. Unscented, too. Sean Connery makes a welcome return. This is the better Bond and by a wide margin, declares the New York Times. Sean Connery is back and greater than ever, says Rex Reed. Joel Siegel says Connery is wonderful. For Bond fans, I was up there cheering. It's inventive, imaginative, tension-filled fun, says the Los Angeles Times. And Gene Siskel of At The Movies declares 007's a winner again. See Sean Connery in Never Say Never Again, rated PG. Now playing. That's my sister. She's witty. I am wild. She loves jazz. I love the stones. Opposites. Right down to our lashes. She likes them soft and natural. I like mine to say wow. But we've got something in common. Dial a lash mascara by Maybelline. She sets hers lower. I set mine higher. My sister will never be alike. But we'll both have beautiful lashes. Dial a lash waterproof mascara by Maybelline for lashes as individual as you are. I'm David Hartman. How will America react to the day after? Well, tomorrow on Good Morning America, we'll return to Lawrence, Kansas, and find out what the people there thought about tonight's movie. Also, what effect might the day after have on the nuclear arms debate? We'll find out tomorrow on Good Morning America.
Ken. Where's Dr. Oaks? Oh, he's probably stuck in traffic on the I-70. Hey, haven't you heard? The one's gone fishing. Who's in charge? Good question. Montoya's in KC. And Julian wants staff informed of emergency procedures in case a general metro evacuation is ordered. So he needs a medical person. Oh, no, no, not me, Bauer. See, I'm just a resident with 120 freshman bodies to examine. Unfortunately, most of them males. Nice try. Dr. Edwards, staff. Just like the Army. Yeah, I wonder where we're going to be next week. Somewhere in the upper atmosphere. Yeah. <laughs> Name? Stephen Klein. K L E I. <laughs> Japanese. Age? Uh, 19. Residence? Joplin? No, I mean on campus. Right. Oh, uh, Davidson 4. What's your major, Stephen? Pre med. He's shooting baskets at the Y. He knows better. This is my second false alarm. I'm 10 days early. A little attention grabber, he says. Where's yours? My what? Your husband. Oh, he's trying to set the plane out right about now. So what's he got to do with anything? I'm not the one having the baby. Yeah. What's it like? What? You know, having a baby, what's it feel like? Never had one. But you said I know. I know what? Back in emergency, I was telling you about the pain. She said, I know. I know about the pain because I'm a nurse and she's a lot like you. Yeah, you want to know what it feels like? What? It feels like I'm going to have a basketball. Hey, where is it? They're all watching the news. Say, I saw a ticker and Judy Francis taking off. Thumbs out, backpacks and all. What are you doing here? Holding my place in line. If I don't get into Bowman's metallurgy class this semester, I'm not going to graduate in January. What's going on? You see, the Russians just invaded West Germany. Three bombs attacked. We're getting by rapid Soviet tank and artillery advances into the Fulda Gap. Having already captured NATO advanced positions along the West German border, the looming question is, how far will Warsaw Pact forces go? Will the Russians advance straight for the Rhine and defy NATO's declared policy of defense by all means, including the use of tactical nuclear weapons? The Defense Department today reported... Fantasy land. You think they're making this up? You think this is war of the world or something? Look, did we help the Czechs, the Hungarians, the Afghans, or the Poles? Well, we're not going to nuke the Russians to save the Germans. I mean, if you were talking oil in Saudi Arabia, then I'd be real worried. What do you think? I gotta get a haircut. <sighs> you know, I think I'm gonna hitch home, see my folks, and I'll see what's happening on Monday. Where do you live? Joplin? You going to Joplin? Hey, son, hop in. I'll give you a ride. Oh, great. I can take you far as Missouri. Make it pretty, Ollie. This is my last trim as a free man. I'm getting married tomorrow. That's all right. Yep. Well, congratulations. Well, who knows? The president's speaking on television at 6 tonight. Maybe he'll tell us something new. Well, they'll tell us what they want us to hear. Keep the panic at the low sweat stage. I really don't think either side wants to be the first to use a nuclear device. You know, it's not a question of who, but where. Over whose real estate. Say we explode a nuclear bomb over their troops on our side. The fallout had better not drift over to their side. They're crazy. How do they expect it's going to stop with just one bomb? You want to know what crazy is? Crazy's not staying out of other people's business. We shouldn't be over there in the first place. Well, maybe they'll contain it. After all, I've still got symphony tickets for tonight. The thing that bothers me is that damn launch on warning. What's that? That's when one side tells the other that they're going to fire their missiles as soon as they think the other guy's missiles are already on the way. You know, use them or lose them. <laughs> what do you really think the chances of something like that happening way the hell out here in the middle of nowhere? Nowhere? <laughs> There's no nowhere anymore. You're sitting next to the Whiteman Air Force Base right now. That's about 150 Miniman missile silos spread halfway down the state of Missouri. That's 
an awful lot of bullseyes. exploded at regional NATO military headquarters. Hey, hey there, Jim. Jim, why don't you go home now? Reverend, we've got a lot more. Well, I know, I know, but you've got plenty to do at home. What good does the dirt do? Get on in the truck, son. Listen, fellas, I'm going to cut on out now. Good luck to you. As soon as we get home, you line up some milk jugs, about a half a dozen of them, put them beside the water pump. We're going to fill them with water and take them down the cellar. Yes, sir. All right, now, don't panic, dude. We'll let you supplies for everything. Just get the can. Okay, folks, all your personal cans will be packed in the next day at four, and uh, the staff will just take credit cards. Why not let this help? Just don't panic. Stay calm and collect this place. We just hit one of our ships in the Persian Gulf. Who's this? The, the Russians, who do you think? When we hit them back, one of their ships, you know? Given a choice between learning computing and playing video games, which do you think a kid would choose? Exactly. That's why Zortec, a new learning game, was created exclusively for Commodore home computers. As kids play Zortec, they're really finding their way around a computer keyboard and mastering basic computer programming. So before you buy a computer for your kids to learn on, make sure it's one they'll want to learn on. One that plays Zortec and other famous learning games. A Commodore home computer. No diet in the world will help you lose weight until you do one thing, control your appetite. With Dexatrim, I was able to control my appetite. 
and I lost weight. The Extra Strength Dexatrim Diet Plan, the strongest appetite control formula you can buy without prescription. Dexatrim helps you eat less and lose weight. Dexatrim curved my desire to eat. I lost weight because I ate less. Extra Strength Dexatrim, no appetite control capsule works harder to help you lose weight. If you think these cars are the same, you're in for a surprise. Sure, you can rent any of them at the airport, but the one from Dollar is different. It is? I don't see any difference. Do you see any difference? I don't see any difference. Do you see any difference? I don't see any difference. Does this look different to you? I can't tell the difference. Can you? I can't tell the difference. So what makes Dollar different? The price. Dollar rent a car. You'll recognize the difference. Now you can rent a Ford Thunderbird for just $33 a day. There's a new album steaming your way, loaded with nothing but hits, hot tracks. Get on board with Michael Sambello. Your Rhythmics. Your Ticket to Rock with Brian Adams, Def Leppard, Naked Eyes, and Rex Springfield. Super Sticks. Red Hot Police. 14 hot tracks, nothing but hits, hot tracks at a store near you. Tonight's ABC Theater presentation, The Day After, will continue in a moment. I'm Ted Koppel. Watching The Day After here in Washington, a live audience to participate in a special edition of ABC News Viewpoint. We'll hear from Secretary of State George Shultz and discuss nuclear issues with a panel of experts immediately following The Day After. Yeah. Imports with a purpose. Meet Vista, okay, actors. a whole new idea in wagons for room and flexibility to let you carry lots of things and people. Vista Seat 7 gets great mileage as front wheel drive is a snap to park and boasts one terrific price. New Vista Wagon, imported for Dodge and Plymouth, built by Mitsubishi to give you room for seven and flexibility. Now that's a purpose. The New York steak dinner at Denny's starts with more than a half pound loin of aged beef, grilled up juicy and tender. Next come crisp onion rings, a big baked potato with real sour cream and a piece of grilled garlic toast. All for the special price of only $5.49, now through the end of December. The New York steak dinner at Denny's. It's another reason why you'll like our prices and you'll love our food. Here are two great diet soft drinks. This one's got no funny diet taste. That's why it won lots of taste tests. But this one's made with a blend of NutraSweet. So in new taste tests, this one beat this one three to one. Amazing. What could be better than Diet 7-Up? Except, of course, new Diet 7-Up. Now more than ever. Cliff Robertson is John F. Kennedy in PT-109 tonight. Because the graphic depiction of the effects of a nuclear war may not be suitable for young viewers, parental discretion is advised. Where are the girls? Ah, uh, Jolene's making beds and Denise is taking a shower. Well, get them downstairs. Oh, Jim, can't you see all I've got to do? Don't you know there's pretty much a national emergency going on? Well, it's just going to have to go on without me because your daughter is getting married tomorrow and i got 67 miles to feed. I hope so. But first, we've got to get some things into the cellar. Oh, Lord, I think there's a tornado coming. Daddy, the man on the radio said there might be a war. He's saying how we should unplug all our radios. And TV and stuff. There's not going to be a war, is there? We need access to the keys and the authentication documents at this time. Okay, do you have your key? Yes, sir. Can I get a reading, please? Go ahead and mark it. Uh, check your monitor. That's good. Uh, make it probably one. Uh, Well, there's no other 
can't take you any further. Oh, that's okay. Thanks a lot. Good luck now. Yeah, you too. Confirm, is this an exercise? Negative. Negative. Roger, copy. This is not an exercise. Anybody have a message? Anybody. Message follows. Alpha 7 8 November Foxtrot 1 5 2 2. That's a wrist score 11. It just started, sir. Why? <laughs> Step one, launch key is inserted. Roger. Let's enable the missiles. Program Roger. flight switch, enable. Four ball, LF ball, unlock code inserted. Stand by. Unlock code inserted. Enable switch, enable. Enable. Coordinate. Enable command. Get this is off, we'll do an all call enable. Thank you. Key turn on my mark. Standing by. Five. Four. you to take those tarps and canvases down in the basement like I told you and stay there with Jolene you understand yes daddy maybe don't bother with the bed just now Eva, we've got to get down below. Listen, those missiles have all gone off. Capsule down there. Just down there to launch. Even the radio went out. Radio's out. Last thing I heard was they got that two of our radar warning stations. Where? Beale Air Force Base, California, and somewhere in England. Can you believe it? <laughs> they really got it done. They stacked them. They pushed all the buttons. You know what that means, don't you? Either we fired first and they're going to try to hit what's left, or they fired first and we just got our missiles out of the ground in time. Either way, we're going to get hit. So what are we still standing around here for? Where do you want to go? 
Well, how about out of here for starters? I gotta get my wife and my kids. We're still on alert, Billy. No one leaves this facility. Oh, come Not on, until man. The Who are you kidding? You kidding me, man? The bombs will be here before the Billy. choppers will. Listen. Damn. Listen to me, man. The war is over. It's over. We've done our job. So what do you still guard, huh? Some cotton picking hole in the ground. We're all dressed up and nowhere to go. What about Star and Boyle? What about them? What are they doing? Yeah, they're 60 feet down, sipping on some cold beer and whistling misty. I'm going down there. Forget it, man. You can't go down there. That elevator's secured. You hear yourself talking, bozo? Because I hear you saying that we got direct orders to be sitting duck. Guys, we got to stay cool. Yeah. So what? They're still behind an eight-ton steel door. Enough food and water for two weeks. They're not going to let you in there. There's still that little room off the elevator. Tommy, you know as well as I do that a direct hit will take out the main shaft and boil and star too. Well, I'd rather take my chances down there. your idea. No, not the hole in the ground was my idea. Yeah, yeah, sure, man. Come on, make up your mind. Because you're either going to crawl down in that hole or you're going to shoot me in the back. So what does the book say, bozo? their way to Russia. They take about 30 minutes to reach their target. So do theirs, right? That's a warning, this is Beale. Confidence is high, I repeat, confidence is high. Here we've got 32 targets in track and 10 impacting points. Roger, I understand. Major Reinhardt, we have a massive attack against the U.S. Net at this time. ICBMs, numerous ICBMs. Roger, I understand. Over 300 missiles inbound now. Come on, baby, don't die on me now. Oh.
bad. We left Rusty. We might be down here a long time. There's not going to be enough food and water for Rusty. You mean he's just going to die out there? Honey, we're going to have to get used to things being a lot different. What matters is we're alive and we're together. It smells awful. How long will we have to stay down here? I don't know. I don't know anything about radiation. What's radiation? I don't know. Can I see? Where's Dr. Montoya? Julian. Uh, I'm here, it's pretty hot. Hurry, it's filled up. Yeah, well, get, get, get the beds in, in the halls away from the windows. Have you seen the number of people in here? This is supposed to double the fallout shelter. They're staying around shock or where, where is Dr. Wallenberg? She's got all the radiological equipment. What did you see? Listen, why don't we have any emergency power here? There's no electricity anywhere. What, no, what did you see? You come from Kansas City. What did you see? I was on the freeway. About 30 miles away. I'm not sure. It was high in the air. Directly above downtown. Like the sun exploding. Two suns. It was like... I don't know why I'm here. I don't even know why I'm here. If we're taking you into the hole, you'll be safer there. Protect you from the fallout. Come right through the window to the wall. Put your right. Hey, Julian. Julian. Folks, thank God you know, listen, there are only a handful of doctors on duty. I'm down to about a quarter of the hospital staff. You've got to get the uninjured in the shelters in the campus building. Right, I'll see what I can do. Is it over? I don't know, it seems to be. Well, how many were there? Two, Kansas City, they're more to the south. Well, was it just Kansas or the whole country? I don't know. Well, my husband was in Sedalia. What about Sedalia? What do you do? I'm overdue. Well, we got to do everything we can to protect ourselves from the fallout. What for? Can I have your attention, please? This is this is only a campus hospital. We don't have many supplies. Unless you're seriously injured, could you please go to one of the other campus buildings? We have to clear the area for those people that are the serious. <laughs> That. Yeah, the broadcasting center. There's a museum in the basement, if it still works. These are getting scarcer than hen's teeth. You shouldn't have stayed out so long looking. Well, I only need one for the short wave. Oh, I hope I don't blow myself up. See? Red is positive. Is this thing connected, or is Connie still up on the roof? Here it comes.
Okay, burn cases over here. Hey, senior, Now, please listen to me. Listen to me. We need your help. This is a hospital. Those of you not seriously ill or injured have to work. Work with our staff. Now, this work will be dangerous. We have to do it in order to survive. We tried hooking up an auxiliary pump to a backup generator, and we're still only getting a trick. I still don't understand. Did they burn out? They could have been subject to the EMP effects. What's that? Electromagnetic pulse. When a large nuclear device is airburst at a high altitude, a lot of electrical disruption can be created, principally with radios, communication systems, electrical wires, computers, cars, transistors. In fact, anything that has a battery or a generator might still work. Of course, it's all theoretical. It's never happened before. In short, very little electricity. All right. We'll have to find a nearest hand pump and chain gang the water in. What about fuel to boil water, heat food, sterilize surgical instruments? What about bringing in wood? You can't burn wood that's been contaminated. Just put radiation right back in the air. What about bottled gas? There's some butane, but no more than about three days. Ago. looking for some water. Have you got another cellar out in the barn? Look, I'll die out here. Let him stay, Jim. Sure. There might be 20 people pounding on the door. No, they won't. They're all dead. I'm the last one. Look, I'll help you any way you want. I won't be any trouble. I even brought my own food. I can... Get on down here. Shut that door first. Jolene, cut that light off. Save it for when we need it. Just wanted to see who it was. All right. My name's Stephen. We're the Dahlbergs. I'm Eve. It's Jim. Denise, Jolene, and Danny. He looked at one going off. Splash blinded. He burned his retinas. What do you know about it? Not a whole lot. Pre-med over at KU. Do you know Bruce Gallatin? He, he's a senior. No. But, but you're from Lawrence, so maybe Bruce is all right. Well, I don't know what happened to Lawrence. I was close to Harrisonville when it started. <sighs> Must have been five or six of them to the north, and a whole string of them to the south. They must have hit every missile silo from Sedalia to El Dorado Springs. <laughs> have you been in shelter the past few days? 
Last night, we slept in the chicken coop in Lone Jack. But otherwise, you've been outside since then. Yeah. Hold still. Since making a martyr of yourself. You know what's going to happen next around here, don't you? I've been trying not to think about it. We may be the only hospital operating within a hundred miles. Everyone half alive or dying will find their way here. Too late to become a dentist? <laughs> what are you thinking? I wonder who was spared. I wonder if Dior, Paris, Moscow, are just like Kansas City now. All or now. All right. Is anybody there? Is anybody there? This is Lawrence. This is Lawrence, Kansas. Is anybody there? This is Joe Huxley. I'm broadcasting out of the science building at the University of Kansas. Is anybody there? I have an atmosphere report for anybody who's listening. Dr. Oaks, do you read? Come in, Dr. Oaks, do you hear me? Yes, sir. We're holding fast at just a hair under uh, 50 rads per hour. I thought that it would have diminished by now. I guess that means we're picking up a lot of fallout from Titan missile bases in Wichita, wherever else, out west. The way the wind blows. Straight toward St. Louis. Uh, when will it be safe to move people to other buildings? It'll never be safe. Come on, Joe. <sighs> well, it gets down to under two rats an hour. If and when. Have you picked up anybody else on your on your end? This is Lawrence. This is Lawrence, Kansas. Is anybody there? Anybody at all? That's the first time you've closed your eyes in three days. I do it 
when you're not looking. You look terrible. You sound just like my wife. Here. I think you should eat a piece of this orange. This may be the last orange you see for a week and a half. When you close your eyes, start remembering. Remembering what? My son. Catching a pass. Daughter staring at a penny. I... It's an accident. Well, my being here... I didn't come back to teach my hematology class. I'd be in Kansas City with Ravy. Oh, rave on, please. I never imagined you. Impervious. What? It's radiation. You are looking at man's legacy. The only guaranteed survivor of a nuclear war. Ah, oh, Danny, I want you to I'm eat. I'm not hungry. Denise, eat this, otherwise it'll go bad. Jolene. We can see that, Joel. Where are the matches? I've got it. What is it? Day or night? Day, I think. What day? Wednesday. It's Thursday. 2.30. I wonder if it's sunny out. Can't remember. Can't remember what? It's only been five days, and I can't remember what Bruce looks like. And now we all been through a lot sitting here in the dark. What are we doing down here anyway? It's all over, isn't it? It smells so bad down here, I can't even breathe. Now listen, Denise, you get a hold of yourself now. You know that we cannot go out of here and... Why did I have to use that thing? We'd be married by now anyway. Why didn't I at least get pregnant? Just pipe down, Denise. Because now I can't even see his face! I can't say anything! I can't say anything! I can't see anything! Denise, I just calm down. Get hold of me. Let go of me! I can't see! Go on there! Go Wait a minute. I'll get it. I owe you. No, Jim. Can't taste it. <laughs> but it's here. Right now. All around us. It's going through you like an x-ray. Right into your cells. What do you think killed all these animals?
Where you going? Hold it. Will you? How come? People there. How do you know? A man with a CB back in Leeton. You from Leeton? How's the Dahlia? I, I said, how's the Dahlia? There ain't no Sedalia. No Green Ridge. No Windsor. No nothing. Died in here this morning. I would say that we are running a serious cholera risk. Say nothing of the bodies. And the morgue is filled. Should we start using the garage? Move the terminal radiation patients back into the ward room, make them as comfortable as possible, and I'll talk to Joe Huxley about the rad situation. Dr. Oaks, we're running very low on morphine. There's been quite a lot of stealing going. They're stealing food from the kitchen. A few minutes ago, Dr. Strayhorn got his wrist broken trying to stop a fight down an emergency. Close the doors! Don't let anyone else in. Put on extra guards if you have to. How can we care for people if we have no control? Isn't that what you're trying to tell me, Julian? Yes. Doctor, have you heard about firing squads? Anything about firing squads? I've been hearing talk. The state authority is trying to keep order. They're shooting people. Shooting? What for? Looting, hijacking, rape, murder. That's nonsense. You hear me? That's crazy. Now go back to work. Hey, wait your turn. Hey! Hey, whoa! Hey! Oh, come on, don't do that, man. Cool, is it? Hey, no, don't, don't do that. Come on, man. Who's there? Go on. Okay. these people that's us man if we don't get to Lawrence you hear me hey that's legal tender by the way they got a hospital in Lawrence okay does dr. Montoya discuss the sad section with you why I'm wide enough there's nothing in the way I'm just waiting on here like everybody else who knows what for Maybe that's why you two weeks ever do. If you were in utero and you had any choice about the matter, would you be dying to be born into a world like this? Do you think your baby's deciding whether or not to be born? Do you think I'm holding back by force of will, Dr. Oaks? Bad toilet training. No, I think you've got to be willing to let your baby come whether you like it or not. You're holding back hope. Hope for what? What do you think's gonna happen out there? You think we're gonna sweep up the dead and fill in a couple of holes and build some supermarkets? You think all those people left alive out there are gonna say, oh, I'm sorry, it wasn't my fault. Let's kiss and make up. We knew the score. We knew all about bombs. We knew all about fallout. We knew this could happen for 40 years. Nobody was interested. I can't argue with you. Argue with me. Please. 
Give me a reason. Tell me about hope. Tell me why you work so hard in here. I don't know. to be alive. We'll see how lucky that is. Missouri. This is my friend. Yeah. So one at a time. He can't talk. What's your injury? I, uh, I can't keep nothing in. Not even my own hair. Um, I got, I got, I got these bruises, like, all on, all on my arm, see? And it's real bad. Look, look, see, see, look, see, look, look at Cody. See, Cody's got him all up his arm, like, I know we got radiation sickness. The only question is, is there anything that we can do about it? The radiation count is now 0.4 rads an hour, which is considered safe for limited exposure outdoors. We urge all of you not suffering from specific physical injury to seek fresh shelter in campus buildings. There was a great earthquake, and the, uh, the sun became black as sackcloth. And a third of the earth was burnt up, 
a third of the trees and all the green grass. And then from the smoke came locusts on the earth with the power of scorpions. And they were told... In... See, it, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green tree. But only those who have not the seal of God upon their foreheads. Now are we here today counted among God's servants? We give thanks to thee, O Lord God Almighty, for rewarding thy servants. And those who fear thy name, both great and small. And for destroying the destroyers of the earth. That is county's closed down. Well, there's, there's University Hospital in Lawrence. I don't know. That's awful far. Well, it's her only chance. And Danny's, too. Look, you stay here. She's my daughter. I'm going to bring him back. What's going on? Eve, we're going to have to try to get her up here a little more secure. I'm going to try to put her feet to here. Maybe you can help me with her head. stuff. <laughs> Have you seen what's going on out there? Yes. Well, what are we going to do? of damage to our country is still uncertain and shall probably remain so for some time. Preliminary reports indicate that principal weapons impact points included military and industrial targets in most sectors of the United States. There is, at the present time, a ceasefire with the Soviet Union which has sustained damage equally catastrophic. Many of you listening to me today have suffered personal injury, sudden separation from loved ones, and the tragic loss of your families. I share your grief, for I too have suffered personal loss. During this hour of sorrow, I wish to assure you that America has survived this terrible tribulation. There has been no surrender, no retreat from the principles of liberty and democracy for which the free world looks to us for leadership. We remain undaunted before all 
but Almighty God. The government is functioning under certain extraordinary emergency options. We are prepared to make every effort to coordinate relief and recovery programs at the state and local levels. During the next two weeks, my staff and cabinet will attempt to relocate to National Emergency Reconstruction Headquarters. At the present time, and until radiation pattern reports are made available over the emergency broadcast band or through your local authorities, I urge you to remain in areas offering maximum shelter protection from radioactive fallout and to obey all local curfews. We are counting on you, on your strength, your patience, your will, and your courage to help rebuild this great nation of ours. God bless you all. That's it? That's all he's gonna say? Hey, maybe we're gonna be okay. What do you wanna hear? I wanna know who started it, who fired first, who preempted. You're never gonna know that. What difference does it make? He doesn't know how badly we were He hit. sure would have told us that they would have fired bad. first. He doesn't want anyone to think we lost the war. <laughs> you believe that? You believe everything they tell you? Doctor, wait, wait, wait. You know what Einstein said about World War III? He said he didn't know how they were going to fight World War Three, but he knew how they would fight World War Four. With sticks and stones. Dr. Oates, we have to contend with the number of bodies, the time required for each individual burial. Dr. Oates. The danger of infection now is so grave, the only solution is to prepare for the public graves on the outside of town. Dr. Oates! Dr. Oates! Dr. Oates, you want in surgery, you're for five minutes later. Dr. Oates! 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 Dr. I swear that we made Marilyn that night. We're all changing, Daddy, don't you see? Stupidity is a habit of getting its way. Okay. Didn't happen. It's not. I'm moving to Boston. Boston. What if it does happen? What do we do? Hiroshima was peanuts. This is Lawrence, Kansas. Is anybody there? Because the artist wants to be. Get the landscape. Part of it. Son. Explode. Kansas. Is anybody there? People are crazy. Not that crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
Come on. Yeah. That's it. No more. What's going on? What do you mean, no more? I've got three hey, chicks of powdered milk and two kids at home having eaten since the day before yesterday. I'm sorry, lady. What do you want me to do? You want to come in here and look around at all the stuff right here? Yeah, I've got to smoke more food in there. That's for the other camp. Are you really a doctor? You sure don't talk like one. Well, um, actually, I'm the pizza man. What's your name? Sam. Sam Hachiya. What kind of name's that? What's it sound like? Uh, I don't know. Italian? There you go. Hey, what do you know? Sam Hachiya Pizzeria, huh? When can I see my sister? Um, that depends, kiddo. You stay here. I'll be back. I'm not going anyplace. Oh. So, what we want you to do now is burn out the your current crops, start decontaminating the soil, and plan next spring's planting. Crop selection must consider plants least susceptible to ultraviolet radiation and yields for human rather than animal consumption. Excuse me, Mel, but uh, how do you go about decontaminating the soil? Well, you chiefly wait for the fallout to decay to safe enough levels to either plow under or scrape off the top layers. How do you know what safe is? Uh, we'll <clears throat> have a uh, NERA task force advising each county agricultural cooperative. Task force? Where the hell do you think they're coming from? <laughs> when you talk about crops for human consumption, what about my livestock? Yeah. How do I feed my hogs and my yeah. cows? We're just going to have to channel animal yeah. feed to human needs. Except for uh, uh, dairy cows that pass muster and certain poultry. What poultry is you Can you explain about? what you mean by scraping off the top layers of my top soil? Uh, exactly that, Jim. You just take the top four or five inches of your topsoil. Yeah, and do what with it? We're talking 150, maybe 200 acres a man in here. That's right. That's true. Being true. big is one thing. Being realistic is another. Suppose you find a hole where you can drop all this dead dirt. What kind of topsoil is that going to leave you for growing anything? Where'd you find out all this information, John? All this good advice out of some government pamphlet? Yeah. 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 Fellas, we're talking catastrophe here, not life as usual. Now, the National Emergency Reconstruction Administration's primary goal is to establish order and to aid you in salvaging your resources for the country at large. What's going on down there? What do you think you're doing down there? Who are you folks? This is my home.
Where's Nurse Bauer? See my home before I die.
And just back on. Take your hands down. There they go. Okay. gonna work, is it? <clears throat> it hasn't been that long, Danny. Um, the nurse may still go back. Uh... Your voice is shaking. I'd like to go home now. I want to be with my mom and dad. Danny? <coughs> I'll take you. Stephen, what about Denise? We're all going home, okay? Come on. Thank you. You're not really Italian, are you? So where are you from? Kansas City. You look like you fell off your bike. Niece, I had a hard time finding you here. How's Danny? He's okay. What about his eyes? Uh, the doctor says that I'll be able to take you home in a couple of days. Phone's working? Are you kidding? There aren't going to be any phones. They, they give me this ribbon to wear. But I haven't got any damn hair to put it into.
You look great. Get out of my house. Didn't you hear me? I told you to get out of my house. For those who must design trucks to compete with Dodge Ram, there is no rest. Now get a thousand dollar cash allowance on all new 2000 model year Ram pickups. following suggested reading list, compiled in cooperation with the American Library Association, will provide additional information on a variety of subjects related to the nuclear issue. Nuclear Madness by Dr. Helen Caldicott. On Thermonuclear War by Herman Kahn. Nuclear War Survival Skills by Dr. Crescent Kearney. Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy by Dr. Henry A. Kissinger. The Fate of the Earth by Jonathan Schell. The Legacy of Hiroshima by Dr. Edward Teller. The Day After Midnight, The Effects of Nuclear War. U.S. Office of Technology Assessment Staff. Check your library or bookstores for these and other titles.
I see by your job application, you've scored six million on the video game Munchman. Yeah. And I see you shot down two billion aliens from the planet Mongo. Yeah. You are good at computer games. So what do you know about computers? If you're going to spend your time playing video games, why not play them on something that can also teach you about computing? Get a Commodore 64 or VIC-20. It's tough to grow up in a computer age without learning about computers. Mr. Coffee knows how to say good morning. Last night, I just programmed Mr. Coffee to have my coffee ready when I wake up. With this electronic digital command system, Mr. Coffee woke up before I did, and the brewing started automatically. Now that great Mr. Coffee flavor is ready and waiting. Mr. Coffee really knows how to say good morning. Now, Mr. Coffee is also available in analog clock model. Presenting Magnavox and Ralph. Attaboy, Ralph. Another day with my Magnavox. Look at that Magnavox picture. So bright and clear and so reliable. Whenever I'm ready, my Magnavox is ready. Yes, sir. If there's one thing I can count on, it's my Magnavox. And my dog Ralph here. If you want reliability, get a Magnavox. Because I'm not giving up Ralph. Magnavox. The performance lasts. If you're ready for high-performance photography, the Minolta X700 program system is ready for you. Computerized, motorized, systematized, total capability, from fully programmed where you said nothing, even with flash, to creative manual where you control everything. The high-performance Minolta X700, voted camera of the year on two continents. Only from the mind of Minolta. I'm Ted Koppel. What can be done to prevent nuclear war? That's our focus tonight on a special edition of ABC News Viewpoint. We'll hear from Secretary of State George Shultz, and we'll discuss the issues with Henry Kissinger, Carl Sagan, Elie Wiesel, Brent Scowcroft, William F. Buckley Jr., and Robert McNamara. Our live audience here in Washington will ask questions on Viewpoint. That's next on ABC. I'm David Hartman. How will America react to the day after? Well, tomorrow on Good Morning America, we'll return to Lawrence, Kansas, and find out what the people there thought about tonight's movie. Also, what effect might the day after have on the nuclear arms debate? We'll find out tomorrow on Good Morning America. From Channel 6, this is an Action News Brief with Rob Jennings. Good evening. Tonight we will have reaction to the day after. Elliot Rodriguez watches the film with some Delaware Valley residents and gets their reaction to the portrayal of nuclear destruction. Lawmen in New Jersey find the body of Matteo Salina, whose brother was the victim of an organized crime hit earlier in the month. It may be the most humiliating defeat of the Long Eagle season. Gary Papa has that story, plus Flyers highlights. And I'll tell you what AccuWeather says about this mild weather tonight on Action News. Get fresh anytime you want while I'm cooking. Fresh Farm Best Milk. It's milk that's ready whenever I cook. Get fresh anytime you want. Here in aisle two. Fresh Farm Best Milk. Fresh milk for weeks in one shopping trip. Now get fresh milk anytime because Farm Best Milk stays fresh for months in or out of the refrigerator. So it's ready to use when you want milk. Get fresh anytime you want. Anytime we want. Get Farm Best Milk. More please. Now, Thomas's makes funny-looking raisin English muffins, too. The original one and only funny-looking tasty cooking Thomas's English muffins. With raisins. A discussion on the day after 10 a.m. tomorrow. Right. Here now, reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. There is, and you probably need it about now, there is some good news. If you can, take a quick look out the window. It's all still there. Your neighborhood is still there, so is Kansas City and Lawrence and Chicago, and Moscow, and San Diego, and Vladivostok. What we have all just seen, and this was my third viewing of the movie, what we've seen is sort of a nuclear version of Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. 
Remember Scrooge's nightmare journey into the future with the spirit of Christmas yet to come? When they finally return to the relative comfort of Scrooge's bedroom, the old man asks the spirit the very question that many of us may be asking ourselves right now. Whether, in other words, the vision, the vision that we've just seen is the future as it will be, or only as it may be. Is there still time? To discuss, and I do mean discuss, not debate, that and related questions tonight, we are joined here in Washington by a live audience and a distinguished panel of guests. Former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. Elie Wiesel, philosopher, theologian, and author on the subject of the Holocaust. William F. Buckley, Jr., publisher of the National Review, author, and columnist. Carl Sagan, astronomer and author who most recently played a leading role in a major scientific study on the effects of nuclear war. Lieutenant General Brent Scowcroft, National Security Advisor to President Ford, Chairman of President Reagan's Bipartisan Commission on the MX Missile. And former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who wrote in the current edition of Foreign Affairs that nuclear weapons are totally useless, except only to deter one's opponent from using them. That's our panel, and you'll be hearing from them in just a few moments. But first, joining us live from his home in suburban Washington is the Secretary of State, Mr. George Schultz. Mr. Secretary, if I put to you the question that Scrooge put to the spirit of Christmas yet to come, the future as we've just viewed it tonight, is that the future as it will be or only the future as it may be? Neither. That is not the future at all. The film is a vivid and dramatic portrayal of the fact that nuclear war is simply not acceptable. And that fact and the realization of it has been the basis for the policy of the United States for decades now, the successful policy of the United States, based on the idea that we simply do not accept a nuclear war and we've been successful in preventing it. Mr. Schultz, that is the answer of a Secretary of State to a reporter, and that's fair enough, because that's what you and I respectively are. But what if you are answering the question to your son or to your granddaughter? What would a grandfather, what would a George Schultz who is talking to a member of his family say in response to the same question? Same answer? Well, I would give the same answer. And since uh, children these days are in many respects smarter, it seems to me, than uh, their elders. They would ask a lot of questions about that. And I think it's possible to explain why it is that it's possible to have a policy that prevents nuclear war. I guess what some of those smart youngsters are worried about and what a lot of smart older people are worried about too is not so much the policy but just the presence of so many nuclear weapons, so many nuclear warheads in the world, and the question which I now address to you, with so many of them, is it not inevitable that at some point or another they will be used, and if not, why do we need them? The only reason that we have nuclear weapons, as President Reagan said in uh, Japan recently, is to see to it that they aren't used. We have to provide a balance so that uh, others who have nuclear weapons, particularly the Soviet Union, realize that what could happen to us could happen to them and would happen to them. And under those circumstances, neither we nor they will use these weapons. In this sense, I'm agreeing with the quotation that you gave from Secretary McNamara. But I think we have to do a lot more and do do a lot more we work to reduce the number of these weapons. And it is uh, interesting to note, important to note, that uh, if you go back to the 1960s and compare the amount of destructive capability of our nuclear arsenal now as compared with them, then it's about 70% less. The point that I'm trying to make here is that in addition to having this policy of balance and deterrence, we have a policy of reduction. And in President Reagan's efforts to deal with this problem, uh, reduction of nuclear weapons has been at the top of his list. Reduction all the way down 
to the point of zero. Mr. Secretary, I cannot doubt, nor do I, that that is the President's intention. Why has that policy been so difficult to achieve then? Because since your administration has come into office, there has not been any reduction on either side. Well, no, that's not correct. There have been some reductions as part of a general program to do so, and only last October it was announced that another thousand uh, nuclear weapons or warheads would be taken uh, out of Europe. So that process goes on. But it's also true that the negotiations that have been going on with the Soviet Union, uh, while they haven't produced a result as yet, have focused on reduction. And many people said when the president proposed reductions that uh, he shouldn't do that because the Soviets wouldn't agree to it. Mr. Well, they Sir haven't agreed, but they have come to the table to talk about the subject. Mr. Secretary, let me focus for a, a couple of minutes at least before we go to our panel here on the movie, which became, in a sense, much more than a movie. It's become a national event, and your presence here this evening uh, is, I think, some testimony to that. Is the movie going to be useful? Well, the movie certainly dramatizes the unacceptability of nuclear warfare. And from my standpoint, it says to those who have criticized the president for seeking reductions that really that's the sensible course to take. And what we should be doing is rallying around and supporting, as I think people by and large more and more are, uh, the idea that we should be trying to reduce the numbers of these weapons. Of course, to do so means that we have to persuade the Soviet Union to come down along with us. And hopefully, uh, what we would shoot for, as the President again said in Tokyo, his dream is to reduce down to zero. There does seem to be a certain amount of, of business as usual, though, Mr. Secretary, in the most lamentable way, by which I mean the Soviets are pointing the finger at us, and we are pointing the finger at them, and somehow the moral imperative of arms reduction is going nowhere. Why? It is uh, a subject that we are working on constantly. We have uh, made some very good and interesting proposals. I think that uh, the point for us is to stay there and keep talking. And the moral imperative that we feel, I'm sure, is felt by others throughout the world, uh, no doubt including people in the Soviet Union. And so if we are persistent and the propositions we put are reasonable as they are, uh, we will eventually get somewhere. Let me bring it back to the family level for a moment. Those mothers and fathers out there who I suspect want a great many answers themselves and would like to be able to give answers to their own children, is there anything that American citizens can do? Is there anything that you would like them to do? And maybe those are two separate questions. Well, I think that uh, clearly this question has been and is and it will continue to be a matter of great importance. And it seems to me the effort to reduce the numbers of these weapons uh, around in the world, here and elsewhere, particularly the Soviet Union, is the right thing to do. And so uh, the more widespread the support is for that and the greater the understanding uh, there is for that, uh, the more chances we have for success. I'm not so sure. I think it is a subject that everyone should be paying attention to and uh, uh, registering in on, and that will be helpful. Well, uh, forgive me, I wasn't asking about paying attention, but whether people can do anything. I mean, other than what I suppose I would have expected you to say, and that is support the president's policy, is there anything else that people can do? Well, it isn't simply the president's policy. The proposals that have been put forth in uh, both of the Geneva negotiations are widely supported. The one that deals with so-called intermediate range uh, weapons is based on uh, proposals developed with our allies in Europe and are closely coordinated with members of Congress so that they know what's going on. The same thing can be said for the other discussions that are taking place. In fact, I think it's a fair statement uh, that uh, members of Congress contributed a great deal to the so-called build-down proposal that's the most recent 
uh, proposal put forward at Geneva by our negotiator, General Rowney. Secretary Schultz, thank you very much for joining us this evening. And so we move now to our panel. And let me begin with you, Mr. Buckley. You have been quite eloquent in your denunciation of the movie that we saw this evening. As usual. Uh, now that you have seen it, uh, do you feel encouraged to, to become even more vociferous in your denunciation, or, or have you found some merit in it? Well, I, I think unhappily the Secretary of State uh, misses the point. The whole point of this movie is to launch an enterprise that seeks to debilitate the America, uh, may, United States. May I ask States. you just to move in a little oh, closer sure. to your microphone? Uh, it seeks to debilitate <clears throat> the United States. Uh, the, this is terribly plain. The guy who wrote it says, I would like to see people starting to question the value of defending this country with a nuclear arsenal. That is his motive. And people who have seen the film, who have sought um, to debilitate American expense, uh, 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 defenses have uh, gathered around it. It's become, uh, it's become a, uh, a cause militant. It has a totemic significance. And it's, it's, I'm delighted to hear the, the Secretary of State say such calm and lucid and cogent things, but it's unrelated to the effort of this film. You think that there is a deliberate political effort behind this film, uh, or, or, or are you prepared to concede that if indeed there is one, it may be accidental? Well, it's certainly deliberate on the part of the writer. He says that was his motives. Now, if you say, was it deliberate on the part of the shareholders of ABC, I, I don't think they were consulted. But um, <clears throat> there, 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 there's no question that people who seek to write tendentious copy write tendentious copy because they seek to forward a particular point of view. I certainly do. All right, let me raise the question, Carl Sagan. You see any merit in this movie, or, or is the movie simply an exercise in emotionalism which may cause despair rather than do anything useful? I think in this country we've uh, been sleepwalking during the last 38 years and uh, passed this problem without really coming to grips with how dire and compelling it is. And I think ABC should be congr congratulated for spurring what I hope will be a year-long debate on this issue. But it's my unhappy duty to uh, point out that the reality is much worse than what what has been portrayed in this movie, and this new emerging reality has significant policy implications. The nuclear winter that will follow even a small nuclear war, especially if uh, cities are targeted, as they almost certainly would be, uh, involves a pall of dust and smoke which would reduce the temperatures not just in the northern mid-latitudes, but pretty much globally to sub-freezing temperatures for months. In addition, it's dark. It, the radiation from radioactivity is much more than we've been told before. Agriculture will be wiped out. And uh, it's very clear that uh, beyond the one or two billion people who would be killed directly in a major nuclear war, five, seven thousand megatons, something like that, that uh, the overall consequences would be much more dire. And the biologists who've been uh, studying this think that there is a real possibility of the extinction of the human species from such a war. Let me stop you on that point, because uh, if our viewers were not depressed enough after seeing the movie, I suspect you've brought them to an even greater nadir. Uh, but that, I think that's good news, uh, Mr. Cobble. What is that? What he just said is very good news. Because? If the Soviet Union knows that a first strike is going to mean the extinction of the Soviet Union, then there won't be a first strike. I agree with that. I'm amazed yeah. to find myself agreeing with Mr. Buckley, but that's, uh, <coughs> that is absolutely right. Well, in that case, let me, let me capitalize on that brief moment of agreement, because I suspect <laughs> there won't be very many more. Dr. Kissinger, <laughs> let, me, let me turn to you and ask you then if, indeed, one accepts either Dr. Sagan's version, or the version that we saw here, we are in either case talking about damage and loss of life unparalleled in human history. How is it possible, under any circumstances, to conceive of the use of nuclear weapons? Well, I think that this film presents a very simple-minded notion of the nuclear problem. And I, uh, it deals with the most obvious question that a general nuclear war aimed at cities is a disaster and a catastrophe. I wrote a book on this subject 30 years ago when the notion of general nuclear war first, first arose. 
the problem of our period, the problem we have to, gr to grapple with is how to avoid such a war, how to preserve freedom while seeking to avoid such a war, how to establish, how to create a military establishment that reduces the dangers of such a war, what arms control policies are compatible with this policy, how we handle crises, those are serious questions. To engage in, a, <coughs> in an orgy of, uh, of, of demonstrating how terrible uh, the casualties of a nuclear war are and translating into pictures the statistics that have been known for three decades and then to have Mr. Sagan say it's even <coughs> worse than this, uh, I would say, what are we to do about this? Uh, is it, are we supposed to make policy by scaring ourselves to death or is somebody going to make some proposals of where we are supposed to go? And if people don't make that, then I do not believe we are making any contribution. And that's my objection to this film. It took this most simple-minded problem that everybody will agree upon. There's nobody in this room who disagrees with the fact that this, this must not happen. It's how to avoid it that we should be discussing. Dr. Kissinger, you have brought us precisely to the issue that I think brings us all here together this evening. Uh, I think it can go without saying that there's no one in this room. Indeed, there is probably no sane person in the country who would recommend nuclear war or who would look at that movie and say that what is seen there is, is some prescription for any solution to any problem. We are here to try to answer the question of what, if anything, can be done. Mr. McNamara, you want to take a crack at that question? I think much can be done, Mr. Koppel, much that we're not doing. And I want to start by emphasizing, I'm not talking about the Reagan administration, I'm talking about several different administrations, but most of all, I'm talking about the American people. I do not believe the American people understand the world we live in. I do not believe they understand the full risk that we face. There are 40,000 nuclear warheads in the inventories of the U.S. and the Soviet Union today with a destruction power roughly a million times that of the Hiroshima bomb. I don't know any arms expert, and I doubt if anyone in this room believes that in the next 10 to 15 years we can reduce that number by more than half. And we're still going to be living then in a world 15 years from now with 20,000 nuclear weapons, and I, frankly, I'd... I think that's very unlikely to get that low, but just assume that. What makes you think we'll be alive 15 years from now? Because, because, in addition to stressing reduction in the numbers of weapons, we need to stress introducing stability in the forces to avoid temptation to either side to preempt, and most of all, we need to introduce steps to reduce the risk that those weapons will be used. And I don't want to take more of my... I don't know in my time, but I'll be quite happy uh, during this program to outline a whole series of those things. Well, in fact, you stopped short of where I thought you were going. Let us assume for a moment the, the desirable but probably the unthinkable, and that is that we could somehow agree to do away with all nuclear weapons. Let we still live with the knowledge of, of how to make them. How does one well, live in a nuclear world, one which we will never be able to well, turn back? Well, we live in a nuclear world by stressing that this is a plus-sum game that we're working on. There is a commonality of interest between the Soviets and the U.S. to avoid the use of these weapons. That's what that film shows. I totally disagree with those who say it's, it's a, a, a disservice to the nation to show the film. Not at all. It's stimulating discussion on exactly the issue we ought to be discussing. There is a million times the Hiroshima destruction power out there. We must ensure it not be used. It's equally in the interest of the Soviet Union not to use it. And therefore, there is a, a basis for coming to agreement. It's going to be very, very difficult. And while we're working on reducing the numbers, which the arms negotiations now in Geneva are pointed to, we should pick up an idea that Henry Kissinger put forward. I put it forward, others have put it forward. It's not enough to reduce numbers. We must increase stability as long as we have more warheads than they have launchers, they fear we may use those warheads to destroy their launchers and destroy their society. We must begin to introduce stability. Henry has suggested, I've suggested that we move to <coughs> reducing the ratio of warheads to launchers. This sounds technical. It's not. It simply means increasing the safety of both societies. If we both move that way, we're both better off. There are 15 different actions I could suggest to you 
which if taken today, some unilateral, by the way, we must be more daring, we must be more imaginative as a society, not just as a government, as a society, to reduce this risk. And we must negotiate, we must drag the Soviets into negotiating in our common interest. Let me pick up a point that was made here a few moments ago and address it to you, General Scowcroft. I believe it was you, Mr. Buckley, who found optimism in Mr. Sagan's pessimism. If indeed we live in a world in which a nuclear exchange of what, 100 megatons or more, Carl? Is that what we're Four talking cities. about? If we live in a world in which an exchange of 100 <laughs> megatons or more means whether literally or almost literally the extinction of the human race, have we not reached a point at which any kind of nuclear exchange is unthinkable because of what it may portend? It may be unthinkable, but deterrence is a very ambiguous notion. Uh, it cannot be demonstrated unless it fails, in which case you knew it was not there. Otherwise, it cannot be demonstrated. We have probably very different ideas about deterrence than does the Soviet Union. Uh, I think we tend to think that nuclear weapons have done away with war as an instrument of national policy, that it is insane, that uh, uh, the mere existence of nuclear weapons mean that nuclear war cannot happen, as you suggest. Well, forgive me, there are, there are something like 42, 43, or maybe 44 wars going on in the world right now, so clearly it hasn't done away with war. Are you talking about nuclear war? war? I'm talking about a U.S.-Soviet nuclear exchange, All right. like the movie. The Soviet Union, however, both as a result of its history of repeated invasion and the extent to which ideology still motivates its belief that it is surrounded by hostile states, probably wants nuclear war no more than does the United States, but I think realistically anticipates that it could happen. And if it could happen, then they must do their best to prepare for it. And I think it is that that is the central, central issue of deterrence, and that is we must have a military posture which the Soviets, whatever they think about deterrence, whatever they think about the nature of nuclear weapons, can never imagine that resort to them makes sense. I'm when not sure you, that's clear at this point. Well, when you talk about preparation for it, I assume you mean, among other things, their evacuation procedures, their civil defense program, and things like that. If I understand Carl Sagan and his colleagues, and they seem to be in total agreement with Soviet scientists, all of that is so academic as to be totally pointless if indeed we're going to have a world in which life itself is essentially extinguished what difference does it make whether it's extinguished six feet underground or extinguished on the surface because I don't think fundamentally we're talking about deliberate decision to launch nuclear war we're talking about behavior in a crisis where each side is estimating both the posture and the will of the other side in which case miscalculations can make all the difference between peace and war. And it is in that guise that we must ensure that the Soviet Union can never miscalculate. Before we slide too far into the technical, Elie Wiesel, we deliberately invited you here so that you would bring a humanistic touch to what otherwise threatens to become either a very technical or a, or a, a very theoretical kind of discussion. Is there anything that the individual man can do anymore? Is there any point in even discussing that, or is it out of his and her hands? Not being a nuclear specialist in any way, I'm scared. I'm scared because I know that what is imaginable can happen. I know that the impossible is possible. I've seen the film, and while I was watching it, I had a strange feeling that I had seen it before. Except once upon a time it happened to my people, and now it happened to all people. And suddenly I said to myself, maybe the whole world, strangely, has turned Jewish. Everybody lives now facing the unknown. We are all in a way helpless. We are talking about nuclear arms, about the bomb with a capital B, a kind of divinity in itself. Unless uh, those who know 
militarily what it means, we uh, readers, writers, people, we don't know what it all means. When I hear about thousand bombs, megatons, I don't have that kind of imagination. To me, it's an abstraction. What to me all this means is that the human species may come to an end, that millions of children may die, simply because one person somewhere, and I am not so much afraid of the big powers, I'm afraid of the small nations. If not now, maybe 10 years from now, or 20 or 50, a Khomeini will get hold of nuclear weapons. He won't hesitate, he will not have a discussion such as the one as we have here, and it's fear. Eli Wiesel, you know better than most that during the 1930s in Europe, especially in England, there were discussions not dissimilar from this discussion in which people with the best of motives spoke about pacifism, the need not to go to war, the, the, the horror of war, and some historians feel, indeed I would suggest most historians feel, that it was that very sense that brought about precisely what everyone was trying to avoid. I think what Dr. Kissinger was talking about before is precisely that, the danger that in being human about what we've just seen, we may become not only impractical but unwise. Would you like well, to respond I, I to that agree, notion? No, I, I, I agree with you, and I agree with Dr. Kissinger on that. It's true that uh, pacifism in the absolute sense would be dangerous. We cannot yield our world to dictatorship. We cannot yield our Western society, our democracy, to a totalitarian regime that would have alone, exclusively, a nuclear superiority. It would be foolish. On the other hand, I also know that if we have thousands and more thousands and more thousands of weapons, one day they will explode. Hence my ambivalence, meaning hence my fear. I do not see realistically a way out. I don't know what could be done. Dr. Kissinger, you've been writing about dealing with this notion, as you pointed out a few moments ago, for some 30 years. Why do we need all these weapons, which, as, as Churchill once pointed out, are sufficient now only to make the rubble bounce? Uh, on the, from the point of view of strategic doctrine, of, of, or of military strategy, I have been writing for 30 years that these are weapons in search of a doctrine. Uh, so I do not want to defend any particular level of, fo of, uh, of forces. Uh, the fact, however, is, as uh, Bob McNamara pointed out, we have 40,000 now. Uh, if we cut them in half in 10 years, it would be a miraculous achievement. Uh, the exact same problem we are discussing tonight will exist at the level of 20,000 and that problem is how do we avoid their use that has a component of, uh, of relationship among the superpowers and among the nuclear powers. It requires us to analyze the design of our forces and to design them in such a manner that there is a minimum incentive for first strike by either side, it requires that we analyze what is likely to cause crisis, and it requires that we do not scare ourselves to death, because if the Soviet Union gets the idea that the United States is, has morally disarmed itself and psychologically disarmed itself, then the precise consequences we are describing here will happen. Uh, our problem is to avoid unilateral disarmament and at the same time to develop a policy which eliminates the uh, danger of nuclear war. This is, this is the challenge we face and uh, we have been, we've been going back and forth between extremes of intransigence and extremes of uh, uh, of uh, conciliation, and if we don't, if we do not focus on so, on some of the problems that Bob McNamara mentioned, uh, how we design forces that make for stability, how we communicate over an extended period of time, 
and what political crisis we must seek to avoid and how to handle them in time, then things are going to slide. But the relationship that is being established around this uh, table between the numbers of weapons and the probability of war is, in my view, not true. Uh, the kind of war shown in this film is most likely at the lowest numbers of, uh, of weapons uh, and has, in fact, been advocated at the if, lowest numbers of weapons. If you can, Dr. Kissinger, explain that briefly. Why? Well, the theory, there was a theory at one time uh, that was, and that is still used by many, uh, by many groups, which is that if you can uh, kill a certain number of people, and if you can destroy a limited number of cities, what, what do you need more nuclear weapons for? And then there have been all sorts of calculations made, 200, 300, 400, at any rate. The point is that these weapons have then been advertised as a means of slaughtering <coughs> civilians. This creates exactly the dilemma we now face. Any statesman, I think Bob will, permit, will forgive me if I tell him a personal encounter we had. When I became security advisor, I uh, saw for the first time what our plans were. And I called up Bob as the last Secretary of Defense, or at any rate, the one I knew best. I asked him to come to the White House. And I first asked him whether he thought these figures were accurate. And then I asked him how he was going to handle that issue if he ever had to be asked by the President on what to recommend. So this, this, issue has been, this issue has been with us, and it will face, and it will face, every, it will face every administration uh, of whatever party. We can't eliminate these weapons completely in a foreseeable time. Uh, we should not have a strategy that is designed to maximize casualties because then if anything goes wrong, we will have Carl Sagan's world, and yet we are assaulted, anyone who seeks that course, on the one side by military technologists who think nuclear weapons are just another kind of weapon, and then by pacifist groups who believe that unless you paint the most horrible picture of nuclear war, it will happen, and you participate in bringing it about. This is why it's been so hard to get a uh, is the sort of thing that uh, Bob McNamara is talking about. All right, we're going to have to take a break in just a couple of minutes. Mr. Buckley, go ahead. I may have to cut you off in mid-sentence, though. <coughs> well, <coughs> I'd like to focus on this business of stabilization because I think we have moved away from stabilization. There's a line in this movie, they're hearing all this bad news about all the threats that are happening, the Germans are moving and the Russians are moving, and then the girl says, uh, well, we did have a crisis in 1962, and we overcame that, didn't we? There isn't anybody there who says yes, and we also had a considerable deterrent quality in 1962, which was unambiguous. Question, are we moving towards an ambiguity in our deterrent forces? In the last four years, the German Social Democratic Party has turned right around. I would ask Mr. McNamara, is that a sign of stabilization, or precisely the contrary? but it's by seeing this kind of thing, which, by the way, they all saw before they took that vote last week. Let me... Before, no, before, and I, I promise I'll come right back to you so you have an opportunity to answer that question, but before we do that, uh, I need to say this. As we are coming up on the hour, that this is a special edition of ABC News Viewpoint. I'm Ted Kopp. <coughs> now then, Mr. McNamara, pick it up, please. First. We have a stable deterrent today. We do a great disservice to our nation when we say otherwise. And we will have a stable deterrent tomorrow if we act intelligently. I have absolutely no question in my mind about it. But I want to go back to the two conditions that we are facing, and they're not going to change. I was in Berlin today. I had lunch in Berlin. I was at the wall today. We didn't build the wall. The wall was built 22 years ago by the Soviets to hold their people in. They retain it today for exactly the same reason. I'm not arguing whether it's wise or unwise for them to do it. It's a symbol of the tension that exists. Events, possibly beyond their control or ours, may cause these miscalculations that 
were discussed a moment ago. That's one set of facts. The other set of facts is the 40,000 nuclear warheads that Henry and I agree are unlikely to be cut by more than 50% in the next 10, 15 years. We're going to live for decades in a world of tension and with tens of thousands of warheads, a few hundred of which can cause, pardon me, Mr. Buck, let, let, let me, may yeah. I finish, <clears throat> that can cause nuclear winter or destroy civilization. We must learn how to avoid their use. Nobody that I have ever talked to knows how to stop a nuclear war once it started. Therefore, God's sakes, don't ever start one. That's the first point. All right. Uh, let me let Mr. Sagan respond to that, then General Scowcroft, and then folks, you may as well get ready with your questions because we're going to start involving you with all of the panel. Mr. Sagan. Let me, let me try to make uh, three quick points coming out of the previous discussion. First of all, the, there is a kind of threshold. It's fuzzy, but it's somewhere around a thousand strategic weapons at which the nuclear winter could be triggered. If that's the case, it seems to me that the only prudent policy is to get well below that threshold so that no concatenation of uh, computer failure and communications malfunctions and madness in high office could kill everybody on the planet. That seems to me elementary planetary hygiene as well as elementary patriotism. You don't want to have a circumstance in which we can end the human endeavor. Now, I think that with 18,000 strategic warheads in the world, we have 18 times at least more weapons than are needed to trigger this catastrophe. If you were well below 1,000 warheads, you would still have an adequate strategic deterrence, and I believe just as slavery was once in the world and people considered it impossible to change, and it was everywhere, well, now we have a world in which there's virtually no chattel slavery. Conventional expectations about what is inevitable can be changed if there's political will. And I think that the existence of this catastrophe can provide a political will. Now, just one more thing. We heard from Secretary Schultz in answer to your question, Ted, that uh, it wasn't true that the Reagan administration was building up uh, weapons, that in fact they had reduced weapons, and he mentioned a figure of a thousand in Europe. Now, those 1,000 weapons in Europe are tactical weapons, not strategic weapons. They are largely obsolete weapons, and they are forward-based weapons, which means that they are vulnerable to capture in case of an attack. Now, what the administration is really doing, according to the Congressional Budget Office, is increasing the inventory of strategic warheads from 9,000 in the United States to 14,000. We are going in the wrong direction. Carl, forgive me. Let us leave it in those general terms, because I must confess statistics leave my mind reeling, and I suspect everybody else is too. General Scowcroft, you want to respond to the general thrust of what Dr. Sagan was saying? Yes. There are two basic truths. We are not going to disinvent nuclear weapons, as, as Henry said. The knowledge, and as Bob said, the knowledge of them there, regardless of the number, the knowledge is there. In some respects, the lower the numbers, the more unstable the situation, and the more the encouragement for other powers to acquire nuclear weapons. That's the second time that's been said now. Dr. Kissinger said it a moment ago. Explain it one more time. Why is less more in this case? Because if each side, if the Soviet Union, the United States, has only 1,000 weapons, or, or each only 500, that encourages other powers to become major nuclear powers in a way that they can do because the numbers are relatively small. Well, in that case, what you're, what you're sketching out is a world in which, by definition, neither the United States nor the Soviet Union can ever afford to fall below a certain excessive level. I think for the short-term future, that may be true. I think the, the two truths are that we are in a nuclear age, and secondly, we do have a fundamental antagonism with the Soviet Union, which we may be able to ameliorate, but which for the foreseeable future is not going to end. Now, the question is, what do we do about it? And I agree with Bob McNamara that we are not going to get rid of nuclear weapons. The important thing is, as the uh, President's Commission on Strategic Forces underlined, is to improve the stability, to integrate our weapon systems programs and our arms control, to reduce the chances that in a crisis either side will resort to nuclear weapons 
feeling it can gain an advantage. All right, and gentlemen, that can be done. I have a hundred questions buzzing in my mind, but I suspect that there are at least 200 people out there. Uh, the gentleman over here in about the third row, go ahead, sir. It's your question. Secretary Schultz has said tonight that there's a lot more to do. Mr. Mac McNamara said tonight that we have to increase stability while at the same time being much more imaginative. Secretary, uh, Mr. Kissinger said that we need a policy that will one day eliminate the need for, for, for these type of weapons. I'll tell you what, help me out so that you don't set an example here that I don't want anyone else to follow. Don't tell us what we have already heard. Ask your question, please. Okay, the question is, is it not possible to somehow develop a technological end run uh, to find a solution that might be a space-based defense system, uh, a system that would render nuclear weapons obsolete. I'd like for the panelists to comment on this. All right, we're hearing from the, the High Frontier School of Thought, right? That would be correct. All right, who would like to pick it up? Dr. Kissinger, High Frontier? Uh, I, uh, I don't know enough about the, uh, the space technology uh, uh, to have a judgment. Uh, on whether it is technically possible to do this. Uh, the, debate, the debate on the nuclear issue has taken the paradoxical form that whenever a defense system has been proposed, it has been opposed by many of the groups that are <coughs> dedicated to disarmament because they are afraid that anything that reduces the impact of a nuclear war also increases the willingness to engage in it. And therefore there has been a tendency to deprecate any uh, possible defense systems. I don't particularly, uh, I haven't studied or I don't know anything about the, uh, whether the space system, I do not believe, how, uh, however it's a general proposition, that there is one reliable technological means uh, on the basis of which you can say that now the danger of nuclear war has been uh, eliminated. Uh, on the other hand, I also do not like this undifferentiated discussion of all nuclear wars taking Carl Sagan's uh, 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 form. And uh, what, what are you saying with that last point? Are you suggesting that? What I'm that saying with this point is I, I believe. If it is true that we live in a world in which we are doomed to have nuclear weapons, and if it is true that someday there could be an accident, then it is also true that together with all the measures that have been discussed, we have a moral and political obligation to, to think of procedures, strategies and methods to keep the war from mindlessly escalating into the sort of thing that we have seen on television here, and not to talk ourselves into the frame of mind that the first time a nuclear weapon is used, it must end with the destruction of hundreds of millions of people and a nuclear winter. Carl Sagan, pick up, if you will, on A, the question that was asked, but B, also the point that Dr. Kissinger yes, made, namely you. that that defensive systems, and for example, at one point we were in the process of building an anti-ballistic missile system in this country, that defensive systems are destabilizing because they may lull the side that has it into a sense of security that would permit that side to then launch nuclear weapons on the other side. Well, on the space-based uh, systems, for them to have any adequacy to stop a significant strike, they have to have a technology which does not exist today, which the best experts in the field say cannot exist, in any case something which would cost enormous amounts of money that would have to be deployed on an absolutely unprecedented scale and which is vulnerable to the simplest kinds of countermeasures. So my sense is that uh, the uh, ballistic missile defense system that is being talked about, and there are a variety of them, and obviously we don't want to get into the details, is dangerous, A, because it lulls us into thinking that we can get away from this problem without the kinds of confidence building and stabilizations that Dr. Kissinger and Secretary McNamara have talked about. All right, let's, uh, let's go but to can questions. I, can the, uh, the, uh, the lady in about the fifth row back. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, what are we to do 20 to 25 years from now when the superpowers no longer have uh, the decision-making power about whether nuclear war will or will not occur? And this could be a small-scale nuclear war as opposed to a 
uh, the type of war that, that we've seen in the movie where, you know, complete devastation everywhere. What about the point that Mr. Wiesel uh, raised earlier about a Khomeini or a Gaddafi uh, having that capability? Mr. McNamara, do you want to pick up on that? Well, I, I would say several things. First, we need to maintain and tighten our non-proliferation policy. We have allowed it to become weak and we by that means have contributed to the problem this lady is pointing to. Secondly, we need to establish procedures that will ensure that our nuclear forces are not triggered by a terrorist launch of a weapon or by an accident, uh, mechanical or, or human failure. And we need to ensure that the Soviets are following the same procedures. These are the kinds of actions that we need to take in our common interest to avoid launch against terrorists thinking we're launching against a Soviet attack or launch in the event of mechanical or human failure. In and so one of those procedures that we ought to take unilaterally and then we ought to try to persuade them to adopt as well is to state publicly we will never, never, never launch on warning. We have not yet said that, nor right. have they. You have, you have just raised, I'm afraid, uh, an issue of such controversy that I don't think I can just let it go by. Launch on warning is the notion that if anyone were to fire any missiles in our direction, we would not wait for them to land, but the president would give the command that our land-based nuclear missiles, our ICBMs, it's, it's the old use them or lose them notion, right? Yes. And, and is that in point, well, I'm not even sure if you can discuss it. Is, is that our policy? We have not said it is not our policy, and the Secretary of the Air Force within the past few weeks in California has stated that the administration is unwilling to state it's not our policy, and the Soviets within the past several weeks have in their press indicated that the Pershing missile deployment to Europe is likely to trigger their launch on warning. All right, but now, I think we're both insane if we ever launch on warning. All right, because the that, warnings may be false. Is that not... As they have been in the past. Is that not another one of the paradoxes that seem to dot this nuclear minefield? Unless we maintain that level of doubt in our adversaries' minds that it might happen, they might be tempted no, to try No, absolutely it? not. Because our forces are invulnerable and so are theirs. There's absolutely no reason for the Soviets to launch on warning and there's absolutely no reason for for us to launch Anybody on disagree with that? Uh, yes. I actually, <clears throat> I, uh, I do not believe we should launch on warning. Uh, I, don't, I don't know any administration that would have launched uh, on warning. Uh, and I doubt that this administration then we should uh, say so. would launch on warning. Now the question is, uh, does the concept of launching on warning make a nuclear war uh, more likely. Uh, uh, the, the argument for not saying what we are doing and, sh and will be doing uh, is that if you assert it, it makes the calculations of a potential attacker somewhat simpler because he can then determine exactly what is going uh, or at least you can try to turn it into a mathematical problem. Uh, if you don't say it, uh, there is an element of doubt. But I want to make clear, I think neither side can possibly gear its procedures to, uh, to launch a con warning. Uh, I, I think it's, it's from a procedural point, uh, technically next to impossible, and uh, I think it would be a, a highly uh, destabilizing course, so I agree with the policy. The question is whether there's a great advantage in saying it. This, uh, this I'm not so sure about. Dr. Kissner, here's where I think you're incorrect. What we mustn't lose sight of is the fact that we want to deter. Uh, now, uh, President Carter came out and recommended a mobile uh, missile, the idea being to uh, shield us from that uh, window of vulnerability of our fixed uh, silos which can be wiped out, giving the enemy uh, a leverage over, uh, over us by threatening to take out our, our cities. Now, Congress turned that down. In turning that down, 
we then headed towards MX. But the point is, we have got to head in such a direction as to guarantee our survival of a first strike. And if, right. if, if launch on warning is what we are reduced to as a result of our failure to, uh, uh, to allow a proliferation of small weapons, then indeed that's certainly better uh, if indeed it succeeds in deterring. Gentlemen, there's, a, there's an awful lot that every one of these questions and all of your answers provokes, but as you can see, we have a great many questions. The gentleman in, the, in about the fifth row back, yes, sir, go ahead. You. Oh, you're, there you go. As an educator, I find that young people are increasingly aware of the threat of nuclear war and are very cynical and despairing about their future. My question to any of the panelists is, how do you think this next generation should be educated about these issues so that they can engage in planning for their own future with a sense of hope? Elie Wiesel, why don't you pick up on that? <coughs> the key word is education, and I happen to believe that that is the only way for us to save mankind is through education. It's not weapons. We are talking here about changing weapons, improving weapons. Why not improve human nature, if it is possible at all, to speak about it? Uh, I, too, I, I'm in, in touch with young students. My students are, are, are scared when they talk about the nuclear issue. They are worried. So am I. Because I must tell you, I'm a little bit um, taken aback. We are already fighting the nuclear war around this table. We are already have speaking about the first strike, about uh, warning, about bombing. How can we even talk about it? I would like to educate <coughs> um, our society, our young people especially, to uh, make sure that it won't happen. How it can we, not. forgive me, but how can we not talk about it? Well, that is really the problem. If we talk, it's bound to happen. If we don't, it's bound to happen again. Go ahead, Mr. Buckley. <laughs> no, I think, I think that we do have to talk about it. And uh, Dr. Kissinger, 25 years ago, got hell for consenting to talk about it. So did Herman Kahn. The fact of the matter is that uh, here we are talking about all the tensions we're going to be living on uh, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. Well, the implied uh, assumption is that we're going to be alive 15 or 20 years from now. That's pretty good news, isn't it? Yeah. We, we began with a monopoly of atom, uh, atom bombs. We offered to give them to the United Nations. When we had a monopoly, we dropped one on Japan. If Japan had had one, we wouldn't have dropped one on Japan. So the, I see nothing that has changed involving that essential stability. And uh, uh, although all of us wish this nightmare would go away, in point of fact, it's probably not going to, unless somebody does a lobotomy on the men in the Kremlin. Well, and nobody's suggested doing that. Fif Fifteen years may be pretty good news to men of your generation and mine. I suspect that some of our children might regard that as a rather limited lifespan. He didn't say yeah. there was going to be a, a war in 15 years. Go ahead, go ahead John. I think, you know, we're not talking about nuclear war. We're talking about the steps necessary to deter, to prevent a nuclear war. And to me, that's a, sim that's a, a vast difference and faced with the central dilemma of our times, that is nuclear weapons and U.S.-Soviet antagonism. We have to sort a way through it. And the first thing I would tell young people is that there is no simple nostrum, no simple solution that if we could just get rid of inept or malevolent government would be out there for us to grab to solve our problem. It All right, isn't let's, there. Let's go ahead, sir. The, uh, the gentleman on the aisle with his left hand up. Thank you. Uh, for Professor Sagan, please, 75 percent of the American public supports the nuclear weapons freeze with the Soviet Union, yet we haven't heard that mentioned this evening. I'm wondering if, as an alternative to prevent nuclear war, people opposing the MX missile, the Trident II missile, the Pershing, the Cruise, is that not a viable alternative for people to rally around as, a, as an alternative to what the Reagan administration is planning in the next, not 10 years, for the next two or three years. But wouldn't everything that we saw tonight be possible if there was a free? Well, your question will come uh, in a minute. Why don't I, if I could get Professor Sagan. My opinion is that uh, the freeze, which uh, you quite properly point out, is supported according to opinion polls and votes by the majority of the American people. I think it would be an excellent first step. It tends to prevent the introduction of further destabilizing modernization and it would almost certainly be followed, as in the Kennedy-Hatfield resolution, by an agreement on a 
annual percentage drop in nuclear weapons. And if that's at the 5 to 10 percent a year level, which is what it's talked about, that would get us a long step up on getting to this threshold I talked about. If I can just say one other thing about this. We, in this discussion, there's been a, a sense that you can't change things, that, that uh, getting down even by a factor of two in decades uh, is the most you could possibly hope for. I'd like to uh, read a quick quotation from, uh, from General Douglas MacArthur. He said, the masses of the world are far ahead of their leaders in this subject. I believe it is the massed opposition of the rank and file against war that offers the greatest possible hope that there shall be no more war. And then Dwight Eisenhower said something very similar. He said, people in the long run are going to do more to promote peace than our governments. Indeed, I think that people want peace so much that one of these days, governments had better get out of their way and let them have it. Let's talk for a moment about nuclear freeze, just for a moment. Uh, Mr. McNamara. Uh, the question I want to raise is there, is there is implied in every discussion of nuclear freeze the suggestion that it could happen, if not overnight, then certainly within a very short period of time. Do you accept that? Well, I, I think a freeze could happen uh, quickly, but I don't believe it gets at the heart of the problem we're talking about. It isn't a freeze we need. It's a substantial reduction. It's an increase in stability. It's a reduction in the risk of use. And the freeze fails to address those issues. The freeze movement has played, from my point of view, a very <coughs> positive role in our society. It has drawn the attention of political leaders, uh, religious leaders, and other leaders of our country to this problem. And that's been very positive. But it does not go nearly far enough in dealing with the problem we're talking about. Dr. Kissinger, some thoughts on the freeze? I, <clears throat> I think that, that the freeze uh, will prevent uh, many of the measures uh, that we've been talking about. It would prevent, for example, going from the MIRV missile to the single warhead missile. It might prevent uh, uh, the, uh, the changes in the, many, several other changes in the direction of, st of stability. Uh, I was involved in, an, in, uh, in fact, I conducted the negotiations for SALT-1, which were a freeze of uh, certain categories of weapons and it leads you into an endless debate of what is modernization and what is a new weapon, what is a modernization of an old weapon. So the freeze by itself is, uh, uh, is in my view, not a solution uh, to the problem. Uh, the problem is uh, the solution in the military field is to develop uh, uh, military doctrines that conduce the stability. And there's a second point that has not been mentioned this evening at all. We are talking as if nuclear weapons cause wars. What will cause wars is political tensions and, uh, and crises and uncontrolled ambitions. And uh, unless one is willing to face that fact and unless one is willing to do something about it, uh, uh, if tensions multiply in the world, Sooner or later, there'll be a war, not necessarily a nuclear war. And any war increases the danger in which we are involved, and maybe the Soviets are involved, increases the danger of nuclear war. And there has to be a linkage, unfashionable as this word is, between the military strategies of the countries and their political conduct. And if that cannot be established, uh, then sooner or later it is going to be the political instability that is going to drive us into war, not the weapons by themselves. All right, let's see if we can get to the gentleman way in the back there with your left hand up. Go ahead. We, I'm not necessarily afraid of the man in the White House or us here in building on what Mr. Kissinger said. How do we convey, how do we get to the men in the Kremlin to say we want to do something? What can we do about them? General Scowcroft? I think the men in the Kremlin respond to strength. And by and large, they take gestures of goodwill designed by us to indicate we bear them no ill will as signs of weakness, rather than in the sense in which they are presented. I think it is possible to negotiate with the Soviet Union. It is not possible to negotiate them out of something they think they can get for free. And I think that is the central reason 
why we have to continue a vigorous arms program to convince the Soviets that there is no easy way for them to gain or to maintain an advantage over the United States. If they realize that, I think it is possible to negotiate serious arms control negotiations with them. Elie Wiesel, I, I mentioned before, the, 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 the whole discussion of nuclear issues is filled with paradoxes. Put your fine philosopher's mind to, to the last paradox that we just heard. You cannot indicate goodwill by showing weakness. You have to show strength, and then you can show the goodwill, and then there will be a response. But it's always a building upon a building upon a building. Well, I am not against paradoxes, as you know, but then I am not a political scientist, which is my, my privilege. But on the other hand, I am optimistic with regard to Russia in a strange way. Not because of the strength that you invoke, but because of the people in Russia. I have the feeling that what is happening here in the Western society, meaning there is an increasing awareness about the nuclear menace, I think it is happening, it is beginning to happen in the Russian society as well. The human rights movement in Russia, headed by Sakharov, who is a great hero and a great man, the human rights movement is an anti-nuclear movement in Russia. It, but it may take a few years, but the young people in Russia, I'm convinced of that, will join in a way, will join hands with us. Uh, we have seen it, for instance, in, in, in the case of Soviet Jewry, that the young people in the thousands, and I have seen them myself, in the thousands, in the early 60s already, came out and they dared to defy the Soviet regime, openly. I am convinced that sooner or later, they will move, Jews and non-Jews, and all the dissidents in Russia, will move into the anti-nuclear field, meaning they will try to to persuade their leaders, with all the risks involved, that it is impossible to think about a nuclear war. Mr. Berkeley, do you... Uh, sir, sir. Well, go ahead, Mr. McNamara. No, I, I want to come back just one second to the gentleman that asked about the youth. This is a very important question. What can we tell our young people today about this world we're moving into? I say we should tell them there's hope. We should have confidence. We should not create myths of our weakness. In the 1960s, the presidential campaign was fought on the myth, as it turned out later, of a missile gap. Recently, we've had the myth, and it is a myth, of a window of vulnerability. And it was General Scowcroft's commission that tore aside that myth and destroyed it. We consistently understate and underrate our own strength in the world. We are a democratic country. That brings us strength. We are technologically advanced. We have productivity far superior in agriculture and industry and arms to the Soviets. We just saw yesterday, or day before yesterday, I read in Europe that the CIA is now saying that the Soviets have not been increasing their defense expenditures as much as we said they were. We should tell our young people to be confident, confident of our strengths, and deal with the Soviets from a position of confidence. On that, faint, on that, excuse me, on that faint glimmer of optimism, let me just uh, give a cautionary note to our affiliates down the line. Uh, we are going to go a little bit longer, and I think you can see why. There's no need to explain any further. Yes, ma'am, on the aisle. Okay, um, to address the previous point, how can we talk about a nuclear freeze this point in time when Sahadov is well aware, who is well aware of the serious consequences of a nuclear confrontation, <laughs> states, that in order to prevent a nuclear war and to get the Soviets to seriously negotiate, we must first achieve nuclear parity with the current deployment of missiles in Europe, and secondly, that we must reach a position of strength from which meaningful reductions can be made. According to Dr. Sahadov, it is only by attaining... I'll tell you what, Dr. Dr. Sahadov, I'm sure, has a lot of fascinating things to say, but boil it down to a brief question, if you would. Okay. Therefore, to push, it, push for nuclear freeze this time would be detrimental for the safety and security of the free world. Is, would it not? Carl Sagan. Imagine a room awash in gasoline, and there are two implacable enemies in that room. One of them has 9,000 matches. The other has 7,000 matches. Each of them is concerned about who's ahead, who's stronger. Well, that's the kind of situation we are actually in. The amount of weapons that are available to the United States and the Soviet Union are so bloated, so grossly in excess of what's needed to dissuade the other, that if it weren't so tragic, it would be laughable. What is necessary is to reduce the matches and to clean up the gasoline. 
I have great respect for Carl Sagan's judgment, but it is true that Andrei Sakharov himself suggested that the United States probably had to, de to deploy the MX missile in order to bring the Soviets to the bargaining table. All right, folks, uh, before we even start with the smattering of applause, we had a little compact before, we're going to keep it. No signs of approval or disapproval. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, the, uh, the lady in the back. I don't think Dr. Sagan should uh, be Mr. Barclay, to shake his head. Well, uh, let, let, let Dr. Sagan shake, shake his head, and you can shake yours, and let's get on to the next question, please. <laughs> Many of the panelists have been emphasizing that what the real objective is, is the pursuit of stability in the world. Uh, Secretary McNamara, Mr. Kissinger both emphasized this. I have to ask, in light of that, and if we want to re reduce the probability of a conventional war escalating into a nuclear war, is it uh, time for us to question our policies in the Middle East and our invasion of Grenada, our plans for invasion of Central America, isn't, isn't that the type of situation that could, in fact, emerge and erupt into a nuclear war? Mr. Buckley? Well, uh, theoretically, anything could result in a nuclear war if the Soviet Union thought it could win it. <clears throat> but I think that we prove that we are stronger than Grenada, and that uh, uh, in, in, in flexing our muscles there, uh, we probably convinced the Soviet Union not that it would be profitable to provoke us with a nuclear war, but that they had better watch out before they start uh, trying to gobble up the Caribbean. So I, th I think on, on the whole, our venture in Grenada was definitely a venture towards uh, a stability. And I wouldn't be surprised if when he was Secretary of Defense, Mr. McNamara had an invasion of Grenada as a contingency operation. Did you? <laughs> no. All right, let's go on to the next question. Yes, sir. I'd, I'd like to return to an affirmative approach to some of these problems. Secretary Kissinger mentioned the need for new institutions with which to maintain stability. At this time, thousands of Americans have joined together to work for the establishment of a National Peace Academy, which would uh, focus and concentrate study and research in the field of peacemaking and conflict resolution. My question to the panel is, would it not be a, a method of trying to prevent what we saw tonight by de devo devoting some of our resources to the field uh, to study and research in this field. Isn't it, and isn't it time that we got on with it? Dr. Kissinger, are we in, in suggesting a peace academy and suggesting that we devote our resources to that? Are we being naive or is that in fact the, the reality with which we have to come to grips? No, I think that the problem of, uh, of peace uh, requires careful thought and study. I am uneasy about the concept of a peace academy uh, because I do not believe you can segregate the notion of peace and the no uh, from the notion from the general conduct of international uh, affairs. Uh, it used to be said uh, 25 years ago, in fact I said it myself at the time, that if we could only devote more resources to the study of arms control uh, we would make great breakthroughs in thinking about arms control. In fact, almost all of the breakthroughs that were made in the thinking on arms control happened before a lot of resources were devoted to its study because I had an uneasy feeling the same papers were written over and over again uh, as research funds uh, uh, became, uh, became available. Uh, I, I don't like the idea that peace is something abstract and that there's a group of peace lovers and a group of warmongers. Uh, I, I think we have to study the whole context of international relations for the purpose of bringing about peace, stability, progress towards peace and stability. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, so I, it isn't something I would publicly oppose or would have taken a position on if you hadn't raised the question at right. this, at this uh, program and I wouldn't feel deprived if it happened. Ladies and gentlemen, let me give you fair warning. We're coming down to roughly our last 10 minutes, so let's see if we can make the questions crisp and the answers equally crisp. Yes, sir, it's your question. Yes, I'd like to direct my questions to both uh, Mr. Scowcroft and Mr. Kissinger. Uh, if, in fact, what we're trying to do now is move away from single warhead, I, move away from MIRV ICBMs towards single warhead ICBMs, why are we then moving forward with the 10 warhead MIRV MX missile? General Scowcroft? Uh, I think <clears throat> because uh, it's essential 
to deploy the MX in order to get from here to there. The single warhead missile is a long ways away. The Soviets at the present time have an advantage in land-based ICBMs. You can argue about the significance of that, but in fact it does exist. There's no reason they should give up that advantage without, without some incentive to do so. And last but not least, we've now had four presidents who have said that the MX missile is important, if not vital, to our national security. Now, to get back to this idea of, of deterrence and the will aspect of deterrence, uh, to go back on that uh, when there'd been no change in the circumstances, it seems to me would be, would be very detrimental. But uh, the small single warhead missile can best survive in an arms control environment which the MX should help preserve. Uh, uh, Senator uh, Warner, I'm not going to call on you for the very reason that your senatorial rank gives you a chance to talk to these gentlemen all the time. The lady over there on the aisle. <laughs> You've talked a lot, Mr. Sagan, about a nuclear freeze. How can you talk about a nuclear freeze when we're dealing with people who would kill civilians on, a, on an airliner, who would use chemical weapons against women and children along with soldiers, and people who have never held up to many treaties that we made with them. How can we trust the Soviet Union when we're talking about arms control and a nuclear freeze? Without uh, debating the, whether what you said is factually right or not, which could be interesting but may be too time consuming, let me merely quote Averill Harriman, uh, who uh, said in this context, that the only thing you can trust the Russians to do is to act in their own interest. And it is very clear that it is in their interest, as it is in our interest, to first freeze and then make a very steep decline in the total number of warheads in the world. What's more, we do have to trust and we can trust our own technology because the ability of the United States through reconnaissance satellites and other national technical means to verify a freeze and a major reduction is very clear. All right, let's move on to the next question. The uh, gentleman with his right hand up, go ahead. I'd like for the panel to react to a key point that I think that they haven't reacted to thus far, and that is, how do you accomplish a verifiable reduction in nuclear arms? Mr. Buckley, you want to take a crack at that? <clears throat> that's, a <clears throat> that's a technical, que technical question I don't have uh, the answer to. All right, it then, is widely, uh, it's widely alleged that they're violating SALT-1 right now, maybe Dr. Kissinger can tell us whether that's true or not with that radar installation they have in Siberia. Well, rather than, rather than, than isolating on that point, is it in fact, Dr. Kissinger, possible to independently verify that the Soviets are keeping to agreements that they make? And to address the point that was raised just a moment ago, do we do it on the basis of trust ever? We shouldn't do it on the, we should not do it on the basis of trust during the period that I had access to, uh, to that kind of intelligence information, I did not believe that they were violating uh, SALT-1. There was one case of a marginal nature which was stopped uh, uh, when we called it to their attention, but uh, uh, on that particular issue of the radar station, if that is as described, I would, add, I would consider that a violation. All right, we're down to our last couple of questions. The lady in the front row. Secretary McNamara, you said that you had a list of about 18 things that the United States could do, and you mentioned uh, no launch on warning, you've written about no first use, and I wonder if you would please tell us what some of the other things are, both multilateral and unilateral, that the United States and the Soviet Union could do. Yeah, so but, but, only, but only three, the top three, three thank you. Three yes. because of <laughs> I'd be happy to tell you later the other 15. But, but first, we should reduce the number of warheads in Europe far more than we've agreed to so far. There are roughly 6,000 warheads there. They're obsolete, they're vulnerable, they're dangerous, they're useless. We could cut them in half tomorrow and be ahead. Secondly, we should withdraw of the remaining half those that are in the forward areas of Germany. They would be overrun in the early hours of a conflict. There would be a use them or lose them uh, tension. And the great danger is they'd be used and start the conflagration we'd all want to stop. Thirdly, we could uh, engage the Soviets into much more productive negotiations of how to stabilize our respective forces beyond freezing or reducing the numbers. This is perhaps the most important single thing 
we could do to to uh, to avoid uh, unintended use of these weapons. Mr. McNamara, uh, allow me to consider that your statement of summation, and I'm going to let the other five panelists give us their closing thoughts because we are quite literally sure. down to our last couple of minutes. General Scowcroft? I think the key issues are how we sort our way through what is a very dangerous period. I do agree, as Mr. McNamara said, that in the long term we have every reason for hope. The resources available to the West are so out of proportion to those available to the Soviet Union that if we can survive the next decade, next 10, 15 years, uh, I think we will be in good shape. All right, I'm going to place a very high premium on brevity, Dr. Sagan. Uh, I think that uh, this can be done. We can get out of this trap that we and the Soviets have jointly set for ourselves and our civilization and our species. But the way to cut nuclear weapons is to cut nuclear weapons. Dr. Kissinger. I think we must have uh, confidence in ourselves and uh, we can solve both the uh, arms control problem and we must solve the political problem that is created by uh, the deliberate creation of tensions in the world. Uh, in that case, uh, if we do not unilaterally disarm ourselves psychologically, I believe that at the end of a, of a 10 to 15 year period, uh, the, the changes in the Soviet system that Eli, Eli Wiesel has talked about are likely to occur. Eli Wiesel? I'm afraid of madness. I'm afraid that madness is possible in history. We have seen it that occasionally madness erupts in history. And uh, the only way, I believe, to prevent that madness would be to remember. If we remember that things are possible, then I believe memory can become a shield. Mr. Buckley. We saw tonight a hypothetical catastrophe there is an ongoing catastrophe that is not hypothetical, that's life in the Soviet Union under Gulag. Uh, I very much regret the kind of drunk thought that uh, is encouraged uh, by ventures of reductionism of the kind that that movie uh, suggested. There is not that uh, in the conversation here tonight for which I think we are all are grateful, but we have only to remember this, we have to fear the Soviet Union because they have an appetite to govern us and do to us what they have done to their wretched people. You have taken the words out of my mouth in thanking everyone here for the high level on which this <laughs> discussion has been conducted. I would also like to thank our audience for the thoughtful questions that they pose and to apologize to the many of you who I know wanted to ask questions but simply did not get the opportunity. One reason you didn't is that I have a closing thought and I would like to deliver it now. It is a paradox that the most emotional issue of our time, possibly the most emotional issue of all time, namely the potential annihilation of the human race, needs more than anything to be considered calmly and without emotion. In that respect, tonight's presentation of the day after may have been less than useful. It is difficult to be calm in the face of Armageddon. It is next to impossible to be unemotional when the apocalypse is shown to be so easily within our reach. But if the film has shed something of a national tendency toward complacence, then the, that is good. We need to talk about the problem. We need to examine not only as a nation, but as members of an endangered species, means toward a solution. We cannot succeed in that goal if we are rigid and doctrinaire in our approach to those with whom we disagree. What is at stake this time is much more than simply winning an argument. This coming week, Tuesday through Friday on Nightline, we will present The Crisis Game. Ten high-ranking officials who served former administrations in the military, intelligence, and in diplomacy will show you how the decision-making process at the highest level of government works, or sometimes does not work, during a time of great international crisis. Among those taking part, former Senator and Secretary of State Edmund Muskie, who will play the role of President former Secretary of Defense and advisor to Presidents Truman and Johnson, Clark Clifford, who will play the role of Secretary of State. And playing the role he also played in government, former Secretary of Defense, James Schlesinger. The crisis game will be on Nightline this coming week, Tuesday through Friday, 11.30 p.m., 10.30 Central Time. 
That concludes this edition of Viewpoint. Again, my thanks to everyone here. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. Good night. From Washington, this has been an ABC News special edition of Viewpoint. News is really a mirror held up to society. It shows us who we are, how we are, and what we're doing. We bring you face to face with the world. ABC's World News Tonight, weeknights with Peter Jennings. Pulsar Quartz makes fashion affordable. All kinds of fashion. Pulsar makes diamonds dazzlingly affordable. Pulsar for parties, beautifully affordable. Pulsar for play, surprisingly affordable. Pulsar for gifts that warm the heart. Pulsar, the elegance of a fine quartz watch, but not the price. At John Wanamaker's in the fine jewelry department, People escape from the demands of the world in quite different ways. That's why at Eastern Airlines, we think you need a travel agent who knows which warm place out of all that we fly to has the best of what you're interested in at a price you can afford. Eastern says, see a travel agent. Don't go to a warm place, cold. Ports with a purpose. Meet Vista. Okay, actors. A whole new idea in wagons. For room and flexibility. To let you carry lots of things. And people. Vista Seat 7 gets great mileage, has front-wheel drive, is a snap to park, and boasts one terrific price. New Vista Wagon. Imported for Dodge and Plymouth. Built by Mitsubishi. To give you room for seven and flexibility. Now that's a purpose. Philadelphia's Thanksgiving Parade, 10.30 Thursday morning on Channel 6. Action News, Delaware Valley's leading news program with Gary Papa and Rob Jennings. Sunday night, a quiet street in Marlton, New Jersey, is the scene of a grim discovery, and the search goes on tonight for a missing West Philadelphia child. But the big story in Action News is the aftermath of the day after the film many of you watch tonight here on Channel 6. The movie depicted in graphic detail the horrors of a nuclear attack. Millions of Americans gathered in homes, schools, and churches to watch this.